All right, good afternoon, guys. We're going to get started here in just a minute. Thanks for joining us for this special edition. Okay, right there. And we'll transition over there. Good afternoon. I show 4 o'clock in Texas. This is, this should be about 2100 UTC. So this is Ham Radio 2.0, and this is going to be a three-day course, about two to three hours per day. We're projecting to go until about 7 p.m. tonight. Uh, which is be right at uh, 2359 UTC, right at midnight UTC. And this is for if you've never had a ham radio license, or maybe you did a long time ago and you want to get a new one because you let it lapse, this is, this is for you. This is for the people in the audience that are not hams and want to get their very first ham radio license. This is uh, what's called the technician class. There's three levels of ham radio license, technician, general, and extra. And uh, a little bit of that is, uh, Chris will go over a little bit of that in the uh, study documentation material. It is, um, yeah, we're going to be following the W5YI study guide, and I have that linked in the description below, and um, several things that I'll talk about throughout the course here, I will link in the description below as well. So we thank you for joining us tonight. If you want to pop in, pop out, uh, that's fine. This will be completely replayable uh, on the channel once the live stream ends. We're going to do part two tomorrow night at um, 6 p.m., which is uh, 2300 UTC. And uh, the third part will be will start at 10 a.m. on Saturday, which is going to be 1500 UTC. I'm trying to do math in my head. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So, this will be, like I said, replayable numerous times. These are some of the most popular videos. Chris and I got together right after the, lock, uh, the COVID lockdown started in 2020, three years ago. We did this same live stream. The question pool changed last year. The question pool for each license class changes every four years. And uh, and this is the new question pool. This is good from 2022 to 2026. So you got three more years that this question pool is going to be good. Uh, so if you want to get your ham radio license, it's you got plenty of time to do that. And that's that's where we are right now. A couple, uh, couple of quick announcements. We're going to bring Chris on and just let him have the reins here. So if you... If you are not a member of my email list, sign up on my email list. If you go to hamradio2.com forward slash email dash sign up, and I'll put that right here. I had the wrong page up. That uh, that looks like this right here. There you go. Oh, no, it, it's not. It is secure. <laughs> it's a forward. So hamradio2.com forward slash email dash sign up. It, um, I, will make the, I will put that in the description below. I don't know what. There it is. There it is, finally. Slow internet today. So hopefully that doesn't affect the stream. Sign up for the email list. Keep up with everything we do on this channel. I sent an email out about this stream, and, we're, and we'll send an email out about several other things as well. Um, we're going to talk later in the break. I'll, I'll bring these up a little bit again. Uh, BetterSafeRadio.com has some really good uh, entry-level handheld radios for the new ham. Uh, Gigaparts has a coupon that they offer to everybody in my audience. And Bridgecom Systems, if you want to get into digital DMR, they have uh, some really good stuff on their website too. So again, we'll we'll uh, go into deeper detail about all of those on the breaks. Because we will go for a while, then Chris will want to take a break. Everybody will let everyone get up and go get some water or whatever, bathroom break, and we'll go from there. So let's just uh, bring Chris on and uh, see what we have there. I'm going to make sure I didn't mute myself on Zoom, Chris, because I didn't know if you could hear me or not. What's up, man? How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Oh, I can't complain. It's it's hot. So, oh. <laughs> you know, that's just how it is. Insane, uh, yeah. I'm yeah, locked yeah. inside it's... this little room because it is, what, 108 degrees outside. So Something like that, yeah. It's a little bit crazy. So, <laughs> All right, man. I'm going to let you have it. Um, how long until your first break, roughly? 
Um, I've got one about probably an hour in. Okay. But okay. if I need a drink or, you know, we get a lot of questions or something, I'll just, you know, we'll stop and, and do that. But Okay. No okay. rush, hopefully. Good. Okay. Well, take <laughs> it away, man. Uh, if you guys do have questions, there will be a Q&A uh, at the end at the um, uh, end of each section, and we will be. I'll, I'm going to help Chris field questions uh, during that time. So, uh, yeah, please uh, type your questions in the chat, and we will try to get to all of them. So, all right, man. Thanks, Chris. Looking forward to yeah. it. Take it away. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, glad to be back and doing this again we've uh we did this a while back like jason said and um so we're looking forward to uh to hopefully helping you get your your license um as you can see on the screen right there we do use the gordon west book um this is a going to be a supplement to all of the material that you read in this book it's not going to be a a replacement so you will need to actually go through the book the nice thing is uh, this course is based on very closely with this technician class book. Uh, so as we go through it, you will see a lot of the same graphics. You'll see a lot of the same information. So um, let's go ahead and, and get it off or get it going here. Um, this is going to be broken down into different elements. We've got... Um, a bunch of different uh, sub elements here. They've been grouped together. <clears throat> Excuse me. A big group together here. Um, and as we work through, like I said earlier, they will kind of match up uh, together. That way, everything uh, can, can make can make sense. So, getting right into it, we're going to talk about the FCC. They are uh, they are the ones who give us the permission to operate uh, on amateur radio they make the rules they make uh, you know every they actually enforce the rules if uh, if you know somebody gets out there and they're they're not acting acting right um, the main purpose of amateur radio is to advance the skills uh, in the technical and communication phases of the radio amateur radio art or the radio art as part of the basis and purpose of the amateur radio service also, one thing I wanted to pull out, if you look right down at the end of the uh, each one of these sentences, you'll see a little, like a T1A, I think that's an A01. That's actually the question that uh, will correspond with the with the point here. So um, the the main point of amateur radio is is to advance the skills of radio, the radio art. Um, looking at these three pictures that are popping up here, these... Uh, these three pictures are people fox hunting. So somewhere out there in the world, there is a a hidden transmitter, and uh, these uh, these teams of people are using antennas to try and locate it. So we call it a fox hunt. That's one of the uh, many activities that we actually do in amateur radio. It's just a lot of fun. So we have three classes of uh, license in amateur radio. We used to have many, many more, but uh, Right now we have the technician, we have the general, and then we have the extra. So going back just uh, 20 years ago, we had, I think, seven, seven, almost eight, I believe. Uh, we had novice, technician, technician plus general. Advanced. I mean, we had a lot of, but now it's down to three. Each one of them builds on each other. So if you uh, you take your ham license, you get your ham license and you want to upgrade, when you upgrade to a general or to an extra, you gain more privileges. You don't lose anything. So um, that's a uh, kind of a side point there. You you gain more privileges. You never lose any. So after passing your examination for your license, uh, as soon as your your name and your license is in the FCC ULS database, Universal Licensing System database, you are a ham. You you have your license, you have your call sign, and you can get on the air, uh, and you can start uh, meeting new people and and kind of exploring the hobby. Your control operator is what uh, is what that's going to be called. Control operator, primary station license uh, will appear in the FCC ULS, and this is kind of what it looks like right here in the uh, in this little screenshot. Uh, so this person can get on the air uh, because all their information has been entered into the 
uh, into the FCC ULS. So you as the uh, the operator or the station, primary station operator, get one license grant to you. You can't have two or three. If you move, you don't get a new one. You get a replacement if you if you file for a new one. Uh, you can hold one license per person. That is it. There's no, no exceptions to that. There are some additions that uh kind of ex exceptions that can be made for um clubs and things like that we'll talk to that talk about that later on once you're issued your license you are given 10 years it is a 10 year grant uh so you have you know from from day 1 till till you know you get your your paperwork in the mail saying it's time to renew um and it's really easy to renew if uh, if you want to do it yourself. If for some reason you don't renew and, uh, you know, you still want to continue to be a ham operator, you get a two-year grace period. You do not get to uh, operate at all. You don't get on the radio, can't transmit. It's just kind of a placeholder for you to renew your license and then reactivate it. So your license goes into a... Uh, kind of a expired state, uh, and it will actually reflect that in the ULS. So that was the first section there. We're going to do a section, and we'll, we'll ask a few questions um, based on that. So going forward, which agency regula regulates and enforces the rules for amateur radio service in the United States? So we talked about, we actually talked about one, the FCC. They are the ones that make the rules. They're the ones that enforce the, uh, the and enforce the rules. So, whenever you see a question like this, the FCC is going to be the uh, the proper answer there. FEMA doesn't do anything in Homeland Security. Uh, they don't they don't do anything with that with amateur radio. Which of the following is part of the basis and purpose of the amateur radio service? Uh, reading these three, providing personal radio communications for as many citizens as possible, providing communications for international nonprofit organizations, or advancing the skills and technical and communication phases of the radio art. So that one is going to be C. And as we go through these, you will hear the uh, the key words there that, that kind of pop up, and uh, hopefully you can remember those. We talked about the different license license levels, um, novice, technician, general, advanced, or B, technician, all the way down to D, technician, general, and extra. So uh, we have three. We have the technician, we have the general, and an amateur extra. And as I said, each one of those builds on each other. It doesn't replace uh, the prior one that you have your your uh, your privileges. How soon after passing an examination for your first amateur radio license, maybe you operate a transmitter on amateur radio? Um, is it going to be immediately on receiving your CSCE as soon as your operation operator, excuse me, station license grant appears in the AR website, or as soon as your operator station license grant appears in the FCC database, or D, as soon as you receive your license in the mail from the FCC? That one is going to be C. So as soon as your operator station lights license grant appears in the ULS database, then you are a ham. Now I'm sure there's some saying, hey, as soon as I I I can I can talk as soon as I can, I get my CSCE, which is partially true. So if you have an existing license and you test for a general or extra and as soon as you have that CSCE, you can operate with some with some uh, some qualifiers on there. But for this, this is a brand new license, so it's going to be as soon as it appears in the FCC license database. So, what proves to the FCC has issued an operator and primary station license grant? A printed copy of the CSCE, an email notification from the NCVEC granting the license or the license appears in the ULS database or all of them. So just like we said just a second ago, 
it's going to be the license of peers in the ULS database. That's the authoritative database for every uh, license, every radio license in the U.S., regardless of the service. How many operator station license grants may be held by one person? One or no more than two, one for each band which the person plans to operate, or one for each permanent station location from which the person plans to operate. And as we said just a minute ago, you get one operating license that you that identifies you. So I'm KD5HOY, been KD5HOY for 23 years, and I hold no other licenses uh, because I I hold I cling tightly to that one because I've had it for so long. Cannot get another one to uh, to go along with it. It would be a replacement. So you get one. What is the normal term for an FCC issued amateur radio license? And that's going to be was it five years, live, ten years, or eight years? That is going to be ten years. And then you will have to renew. And if you uh, if you renew it, then you just it's another ten years, and then another ten years when you renew on down the line. Uh, if you forget, what is the grace period for the renewal of an amateur license if it does end up ex accidentally expiring or on purpose, or what is what is that duration? That is going to be two years. You get two years to. Uh, renew that and you're you just you're just basically reactivated your license has become good the same license uh the same uh call sign no you don't get a different one it just reactivates your your call sign if your license has expired and you're still within the allowable grace period may you continue to operate the transmitter on an amateur radio on an amateur radio bands um, yes, for up to two years. Yes, as soon as you apply for a renewal. Yes, for up to one year. Or no, you must wait until the license has been renewed. And just as we said a second ago, yes, you must wait. You don't get, you lose your privileges until it, it actually shows renewed. Okay. So we are going to start uh, the second one, call signs. This one is uh, kind of Kind of interesting. You will learn the format of your call sign here in just a minute when you first get it, and then also if you uh, if you want to change it, we'll talk about that also. So again, we're in the uh, the technician class book uh, second section here um, under call signs. So the requirement once you are given your license and you're on the air and you're meeting people and you're talking, the requirement for transmitting your call sign. ID, uh, ID um, is every 10 minutes. So you're having a nice conversation every 10 minutes, at least at the max, you need to just put your call sign out there because the FCC, if for some reason they are listening, they want to know who it is that's talking. So every 10 minutes, as well as at the end of your conversation. So let's say you, you're 10 minutes in, you identify and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go get a, get a sandwich and you sign off after one minute, even after that one minute, since you, you still have to identify since it's the end of your transmission. There is one exception given for an un un unidentified transmission. And that is if you were going to control uh, model craft, such as a boat, cars, aircraft, drones, using amateur radio, because that is one of the uh, privileges that you get. Uh, you do have to identify using a tag uh, or some means of you know a sticker on your on your radio or whatever, but the actual transmission itself is is allowed since you are controlling a model uh, car, boat, aircraft, drone, whatever it is. So you're now issued your your license, and uh, you know you really don't like it. What can you do? Any licensed amateur can request a vanity call sign, just like you can get a, a vanity call or a, van a vanity plate for your car. You can also get a, a vanity um, call sign. So in this case, this one is KF1XXX, which is a to me that is it says it's a vanity call sign. That's a tough tough one to save. So um, you know you might 
if that is your call sign, you might consider getting something a little shorter or something easier to say. Now, one of the things to keep in mind about this, um, the way that this call sign is, if you look at KF1XXX, that is what we call a two by three. You will be issued a two by three uh, license when uh, when you pass your test. That is just the default. And then you can go in there and you can apply for um, uh, another another vanity. Uh, I believe it's a you can get a two by a two uh, two by three a two by two. But you can't get a one by two or you know, I'm throwing out a lot of numbers there. Let's just uh, we'll, we'll stick with this. So KF1 XXX, that is a two by three. That is a, a vanity call sign. You can go out there and you can apply for any license that is available for your license class. And you can usually find the documentation on websites for or, or is it is allowed for are you allowed to uh uh, to have this call sign or not, depending on the length of it. One of the things that uh, is it's kind of critical. Um, you might just start working on the phonetic alphabet. Phonetic alphabet is encouraged by the FCC when identifying your station when using phone. And the reason is because we have some fast talkers out there. And if you, uh, if you are given your call sign and oh goodness, so you, you give a, a call sign and, you know, I can't think of a, an example right now, but you may have some, some letters that sound two letters that sound the same and you could get your, your call sign mixed up. So if you could give it in, in phonetic alphabet, like mine is Kilo Delta five hotel, India, Yankee, um, no other license out there is is mine so that one really kind of helps with uh keeping you know things straight and, and people hearing your call sign properly now we talked about one person having a license at a time so clubs are a little are, are a little different if you have a group of four people uh, somebody you have, you know, you can, somebody who will be president, vice president, treasurer, and secretary. Basically, you know, the 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 very basics of of a club. You can apply for a club station license, and it could be, it, it will more than likely be issued as a two by three. But then the club can apply for a vanity if there's something available. While your club is doing some sort of function, let's say you're doing a weather net or you're doing a, um, a weather net or a, say a bike event or something like that, it is perfectly acceptable for you to use tactical identifiers such as EOC or Water Station One or you know any any number of um, stations that might be out there. This will help with uh, basically the people who are running the who are running a net will be able to say, "Hey, water station one, you know what's your status?" Rather than going, "Who was at that water station?" Uh, and trying to remember, you know, what people might be at that they can just give a tactical call sign. Um, your station's FCC call sign must be transmitted at the end of each communication and every 10 minutes during communication. So in, uh, in the case of uh, the, well, the big club that I'm part of here, um, when a weather net comes up, we will activate as EOC or W5HRC. And so when somebody responds and I say, hey, we've had cantaloupe size hail and down the road, they can say, okay, we got you. This is W5HRC. It is something that uh, you have to give at the end of each communication, as well as um, every 10 minutes. The English language is the accepted language and the required language, it doesn't say here, but uh, it is the language that as a US citizen or you know, a US green card or uh, whatever you are and you're applying for a uh, amateur radio license in the US, English is the language you identify in. You can speak in whatever language you would like, but when you identify, it needs to be in English just for the sake of um, 
you know, being proper and let's say the FCC is listening, they want to know who's talking. So uh, English is, is what you want to identify in. Now we can, let's just say uh, I'm, I'm currently in Texas with, uh, with Jason and I'm going to go up to, uh, let's say Wyoming just for a, a, a trip and I take my equipment with me and I want to operate as a station designated as Wyoming. I can actually uh, say this is KD5HIY stroke or slant or slash uh, something, you know, that indicates a break there. So stroke, uh, Whiskey Yankee for Wyoming or, you know, VA or QRP for low power, anything like that. So you, you have your your call sign and then you can break that down into kind of um, a sub operating mode. Like I said, QRP or or Wyoming or Oklahoma or uh, any number of, you know, special operating thing that you're doing that you're not in your normal uh, in your normal um, operating, you know, modes that you do. This is also broken down into, or the districts in the U.S. are broken down into um, zero through nine. So, like I said, I'm here in the south, so I'm I'm a, in a five area, and uh, the the key is here on the side. If I was in, say, Kansas, that's a W zero, or a, excuse me, a zero. California and how um, has W six, and so on and so on. Broken down right here, and your license will reflect basically what um uh your initial area is like i said you can change that with a a vanity call sign but you know oftentimes even with a vanity call sign people will keep you know their initial um station or their region number so any country whose administration notifies the ITU that they object to communications with the FCC licensed radio station stations results in prohib prohibition from ex exchanging communications. Let's break that down into English. So let's say, um, oh, let's say region three has a problem with something in region two in this little map. Um, because of that, we would no longer be able to communicate with somebody in region two or that country, or uh, there are a few countries out there that we are not allowed uh, to, even though the radio signal will go there, we're not allowed to operate. North Korea would be a, you know, a, a good one um, to consider. So also looking at this map, um, the FCC, United States and North America, South America, we are in region two. So anytime you see something that references the ITU region, we are going to be region two. Europe is region one, uh, looks like Russia and China, or excuse me, um, India, China, they're going to be region three. We are region two, so that is our concern. So if something pops up and says, what IT region, just remember, we are region two. Communications incidental for, to the purpose of amateur service and remarks of a personal character are the types of international communications permitted by the FCC licensed amateur stations. The translation, we communicate for the betterment of goodwill. We don't want to get on there and start talking politics because that would easily, could easily get messy, not for, you know, politics per se, but just the, the goodwill between, you know, you and I. So we, we basically keep, our our com communications on HF for for long distance, uh, keep it you know clean, keep it, um, uh, like I said, the the purpose of it is is to enhance good international goodwill. So, looking at this, um, a message from the control operator to another amateur station control operator on beh on behalf of another person is called third party. Um, this map doesn't have anything to do with that, but I want you to look very closely at, uh, the United States here. If you look at the United States, you will see an A, a K, an N, and a W. Our licenses here in the United States will always be one of those four letters, A, K, N, or W. That's what it will start with. 
Typically, it will be a K, N, or W if you're an advanced, uh, grandfathered, advanced um, operator. You may have an A, or as they become av uh, available, you might be able to get an A call sign. But A, K, N, W. Uh, my my uh, Elmer and um, instructor that I used to uh, do this class with, he would always say, Alaska is Northwest, A-K-N-W. Alaska is Northwest. That's how he would uh, teach classes to remember the four letters that our um, call signs could be. Now, that differs from if you look up at Canada, that's V-E. If you look at Australia, V-K. Um, and every country will have their own. Mexico will be X-E, number, letter, letter, letter. So... Uh, here in the United States, Alaska is Northwest, and that is true. So um, even Alaska will start with K's. So going back to the third-party communications, if you look at this, the, the gentleman on the right, that is going to be the control operator and the uh, the lady on the, on the left talking to a relative overseas. She's going to be third-party. So he can allow her to talk third-party on the radio he just has to be immediately available to take control if she decides she or he or whomever wants to uh, get on the radio and and start causing problems they're there to pick up uh, the the radio for a non-licensed person to speak to a foreign station under control of a licensed amateur operator the foreign station must be a country with which the u.s has a third-party agreement Probably about 99% of the country, or excuse me, of the world, we have uh, an agreement. Yeah, hey, contact, no problem. There are some out there. If uh, if you have any doubt, you can you can look it up on the FCC's webpage or the uh, ARRL. They may have it there also. So, uh, you know, I'm telling you this, but, uh, you know, trust but verify. That's what I would I would say. Uh, you you want to make sure to do so. We do have a third party agreement with most company, most companies, most countries around the world. So something neat: um, the FCC amateur stations may transmit from a vessel or a craft located in international waters and documented or registered in the United States. So one of the things that changed from the previous question pool um, was. This question changed from documented, uh, excuse me, international waters and registered in the United States to now documented or registered. So um, because of this, this allows us to do things like ham cruises, which are really neat. You, It's a, it's a cruise where radio equipment is set up and they'll hang an antenna and they'll drop an antenna down into the water because the water makes a an excellent ground plane and you can get on hf and just have the time of your life and so that's something that's relatively new and if you're interested in that just look up uh, or google uh, ham cruise and you can get the information from that so pretty cool pretty cool stuff we're, we're able to do a couple of questions about everything that we just went over when are you required to transmit your assigned call sign? That was something that uh, we talked about pretty heavily. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it's going to be uh, D. It's going to be at least every 10 minutes and then at the end of your communications. That is a change from the earlier days when I got mine. It was at the beginning, end, and every 10 minutes. Now it's just every 10 minutes and at the end of communications. If you... Uh, yeah, let's not get that 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 one uh, confused with C. C is every 15 minutes for a GMRS. Um, so just you know, kind of burn into your mind every 10 minutes and end of the communications. When may an amateur uh, station transmit without identifying on the air? We talked about this. Uh, when transmissions are brief in nature to make station adjustments, when the transmissions are unmodulated, when the transmission's power level is below one watt, or when transmission signals to control model aircraft. So this is going to be D. Now, even when you, uh, in, in A up here, even when, and C, when you're making station adjustments and you actually transmit, you do just, you know, say, hey, this is KD5HLY. 
station or uh, radio check station, you know, check, checking my station or something like that. Uh, but as long as your call sign is out there, um, then you are, you're good to go. Who may select a desired call sign under the vanity call sign rules? Only licensed amateur with a general extra class, uh, extra class license. Only a licensed amateur has been licensed continued from, continually for more than 10 years for any licensed amateur. That one will be now any licensed amateur. Okay. The next one is kind of a, kind of a, a, a tricky one. So, um, read it carefully. Which of the following is a valid technician class slide? Class call sign format KF1XXX, KA1X, W1XX, or all of the choices are correct. Which one is that one? This one is all in the wording. So, uh, A, KF1XXX. These, all three of these are valid licenses, but as a technician class, the KF1XXX is the valid technician class license. That's what you will be issued. What do the SCC rules state regarding the use of phonetic, uh, phonetic for station identification in the amateur radio service? It is required when transmitting emergency messages. It is encouraged. It is in, required when in contact with a foreign station or all of these are correct. Survey says B. It is encouraged. It's always going to be encouraged just because it's every letter in the phonetic alphabet is unique and none of them sound like the other. So that just helps with uh, proper uh, record recording of, uh, of call signs. Which of the following is a requirement for the issue of a club station license grant? The trustee must have an amateur extra class operator license. The class must class must have at least four members. The club must be registered with the ARRL, or all of the choices are correct. Answer is going to be B. The club must have at least four members: president, vice president, treasurer, and secretary. How, must, how often must you identify with the FCC license call sign when the tactical call sign, such as race headquarters, when using the tactical call sign, such as race headquarters? Never, uh, once every hour, at the end of each communication, every 10 minutes, or at the end of every transmission. Specifically said, at the end of each communication and every 10 minutes during the, during a communication that's ongoing. What language may you use to for identification when operating on a phone subband? Any language recognized by the United Nations, any language recognized by the ITU, English, English, French, or Spanish. In the U.S., we always identify in English. You can identify in Spanish or French, but at the same time, you also need to give your call sign in English you know, on top of those. So English is your call sign identification. Speak whatever language you want, but identify in English. Which of the following self-assigned indicators are acceptable when using a phone transmission? KL7CC stroke W3, slant W3, slash W3, or all of these are correct. Well, all three of them mean exactly, there we go, all of them mean exactly the same thing, so you can use either one of those. KL7CC stroke W3 uh, is fine, slant and slash is also. Which countries are the FCC licensed amateur radio stations prohibiting prohibited from exchanging communications? Any country whose administration has notified the international, the ITU, that it objects to such communications, any country whose administration has notified the ARRL that they object, any country banned from communications by amateur radio union, or any country banned from making such communications by the American radio relay, the ARRL. This one is going to be, it is the government's 
uh, who can make these these rules. The ARL is a uh, organization, is an amateur radio organization that does lobbying, provides training, um, any different events. The IARU is just uh, kind of kind of the same thing on a much larger uh, worldwide scale. Um, so the ITU is is where the uh, the objection would be sent to, and then that would be sent to the FCC and whatever they have over in Europe. So, what types of international communications are an FCC licensed amateur radio service station permitted to make? Communication incidental to the purpose of the amateur radio service and remarks of a personal of a personal character. Excuse me. Uh, communications incidental to conducting business or remarks of a personal nature. Only communications incidental to con in, to contest exchanges and all other communications that prohibited or any communication that be permitted by international broadcast station. Read the details and the and the questions and the answers on this one. This one. A and B look similar. They've got similar wording, but this one is going to be for the purpose of amateur radio service and remarks of a personal character. Uh, we don't do anything with business. We don't provide business services. So that would be one way to identify the differences in those. What is meant by the term third-party communications? Um, a message from a control operator to another amateur station control operator on behalf of another person. Amateur radio communications where three stations are in communications with one of another. Operation when the transmitting equipment is licensed to a person other than the control operator. Or D, temporary authorization for unlicensed person to transmit on the amateur bands for technical experiments. That one's going to be letter A. A message from a control operator to another control operator on behalf of another person. Which of the following restrictions apply when a non-licensed person is allowed to speak to a foreign station using a station under the control of a licensed amateur operator? Uh, that person must be a U.S. citizen. B, that foreign, the foreign station must be one which the U.S. has a third-party agreement. C, the licensed control operator must do the station identification or D, all of the choices are correct. That one's going to be B. The foreign station must be one which the U.S. has a third-party agreement. Um, and, you know, if you're in Europe and you're talking back, that's, you know, no problem at all. Which of the following locations may an FCC licensed amateur station transmit? From any country that belongs to the ITU, from B, within a country that is a member of the United Nations, C, from anywhere within the ITU regions 2 and 3, and from any vessel or craft located in international waters and documented or registered in the United States. That one's going to be D. So uh, if you read C, I remember I did say region 2, IT region 2, is what affects us, but what makes that one incorrect is going to be regions two and three. We don't deal in, in region three, so that has nothing to do with us. Um, and so any vessel located in international waters and documented or registered in the United States, that documented or registered is, is the good the good part that allowed allowed us to start doing more on boats. All right, so we can pause here for just a second. If anybody has any uh, questions, I'm going to get a quick, quick guzzle of water. Give me just a second, and then we'll uh, we'll kick back off here in about. Ten oh, you muted yourself. Okay, I was like, oh, did I lost the sound. <laughs> no, you're good. Cool. Yeah. So if you guys are, uh, if you guys have questions throughout, I don't want to interrupt his flow or anything like that. But, um, but I am watching the chat off and on, and um, you can type your question in the chat, and we will get to it. Now, I will say that you know, as you've already seen, he has a Q and A at the end of each section, so um, it's possible your question could get get answered anyway. But um, yeah. 
if you if you want to uh, ask a question, feel free to type it in the chat because we are watching that. Cool. All right, good. let's uh, let's push on through. Yeah, cool. I am doing good. All right, thanks. All right, so we're going to go into uh, next element element about control. <laughs> Again, we're still in the in the book that uh, uh, looks just like this. You can get that uh, from the W5YI, and this this material follows this book very closely. Okay, an amateur station may never transmit without a control operator. Period. An amateur station whose license privileges allow them to transmit on the satellite uplink frequency may be the control operator of a station communicating through an amateur satellite or space station. So, what does that mean? The station licensee must designate the control operator even as a satellite um, if you want to do satellite. When the control operator is not the station license licensee, the control operator and the station licensee are responsible for proper operation of the station. So you might be the owner of the equipment at your, at your home. You might be the station licensee, uh, but you've got a buddy that comes over and, you know, is looking at this and, um, you know, you get up for a second while all of a sudden now they're the control operator. They've got all the knobs and that licensee uh, of the station is responsible for the operation of the station. So if your your guest gets on there and starts pushing buttons and turning knobs and causing interference, it is your responsibility to fix it. The class operator license held by the control operator determines the transmitting privileges of an amateur station. So if you are a technician and your Elmer is a uh, is an extra, and you go over to their house you you don't gain privileges you have to stay on your uh your what your frequency privileges are you don't you don't you know uh gain any kind of special privileges because of uh you know you're sitting next to somebody under normal circumstances a technician class licensee at no time may be the control operator of a station operating an extra class band segment that temptation to uh just push that microphone or the transmit button could be too great for some. So as a technician, you cannot you cannot be the station operator in an extra class band segment at all, period. Mm -mm. And the the uh, uh, if you look online, you will find uh, frequency band charts and you will actually see extra class sections that are they're chopped out right there. Extra class only uh, generals can't play in there. Technicians can't play in there at all. So. All right. The location in which the control operator function is performed is the amateur station control point. So there are different kinds of control uh, radio control systems. A repeater is going to be an example of automatic control. Automatic control means there's nobody sitting there at the repeater, but you can take your radio as a as a licensed amateur. You can take your radio. You can um, key up that repeater, put your call sign out there, and the repeater will respond by retransmitting your voice. So that is automatic control depending on um, you know, who it is or how, how it's functioning. So a uh, repeater is automatic control. It will it will automatically retransmit your information or your, your voice or data or whatever it is automatically because that's what it's designed to do. Uh, operating the station over the internet is an example of remote control as defined in, defined in part 97. So remote control is kind of neat. This is something that's really over the past few years um, caught on. Um, so you've got a big, beautiful station with a tower and, you know, everything that you could ever want at your house. And you're going on a trip, but you have the capability, your radio has the capability of operating remote. And so you get to your hotel and you're like, I'm going to give this a try. And you're able to connect back to your home uh, equipment and you're able to uh, remotely control your radio. That's perfectly, perfectly, uh, perfectly fine. A lot of, a lot of people do that. Uh, keep in mind that that, that control operator is still, 
in control. The control point is now is still at, at at home though. So just like I said, what about remote control operation? Control operator must be at the control point, being able to stop the transmission at any time if for some reason something it goes awry. Uh, control operator is required at all times. So while you're transmitting, you need to be available at all times to manipulate the controls or do whatever needs to be done. The control operator indirectly manip manipulates the controls, um, even if that's remotely uh, over the internet. All three of these are are proper. These are what you have to do. Unless document documentation to the contrary in the station records, the FCC presumes the station licensee is the control operator of the amateur station. Uh, I really can't give you a, a proper example of another time when that wouldn't be, but uh, they do exist, I'm sure. So you're you're the licensee. It's your station. You are the the control operator. A control operator of the amateur station may give compensation, may receive compensation. Excuse me for operating that station when communication is incidental to a classroom instruction at an educational institution. What does that mean? So what that means is I am actually doing this class for you. I cannot. I can't receive payment. It is not something that uh, is legal for me to do. Uh, now, if I am a school teacher and I say I would like to do a technician class for uh, students, I can do that and be paid because that's I am an employee of a school receiving my my regular wages. And as I'm doing this class, is just part of being part of the educational institution. So I can't accept money unless I am a teacher teaching this class. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> the control operator of the originating orig origination station is accountable should a repeater inadvertently transmit communications that violate the FCC rules. Now that is... Uh, Kind of a change of subject, and so um, we'll see that a, a couple of times through here. But I'm going to try to make sure that I explain what what all this means. So we were talking about the, uh, the classroom education, and now uh, the control operator is going to be accountable. Let's say a repeater is just going haywire and it's transmitting just you know garbage out there on the on the air. Somebody is responsible for controlling that repeater. The Hearst Club that I'm part of, we have a couple of people who, uh, one person is the actual uh, designee, or the, um, they are, yeah, they are the designee. Uh, the FCC, if something, they need to reach somebody about a repeater, they will go to that person. But we have, a, we have two or three people who can remotely control repeaters just in case something goes crazy. All right, some of the questions. When may an amateur station when may an amateur station permitted to when may an amateur station be permitted to transmit without a control operator? Uh, when using automatic control, such as in the case of repeater, when the station license is away and another licensed amateur is using the station, when transmitting station is an auxiliary station, or D never. Keep in mind, you cannot transmit on a station without a control operator, whether that's remote, remotely operated, or whatever. Somebody has to be responsible for things that might 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 happen regarding that equipment. Who may the control operator of a station communicating through an amateur satellite or a space station? Uh, amateur extra class operator only, general class or higher. Uh, with the satellite operator certificate, uh, only an amateur extra, extra operator who is an AMSAT member or any amateur allowed to transmit on the satellite uplink frequency. 
the uplink frequency that d right there that's going to be the one the uplink frequencies are generally in the 400 either in the two meter or in the 400 band 440 megahertz band or 70 centimeter um same thing any amateur that has permissions uh to transmit on those frequencies does have permission to operate on satellite we'll go over those uh some of those frequencies just briefly here shortly so you can actually see what uh, uh or where where those frequencies actually are who must designate the station control operator the station licensee the fcc the frequency coordinator or any licensed operator so somebody is going to be designated and they're going to be designated by the station licensee When the control operator is not the station licensee, who is responsible for the proper operation of the station? All licensed amateurs who are present at the operation, uh, only station licensee, only the control operator, or only, excuse me, the control operator and the station licensee. So when the control operator is not the station licensee, who is responsible for the proper operation of the station? It's going to be D, the control operator and the station licensee, assuming they're, they're you know, the different, and it, I mean, it's going to be the same person unless there's some strange reason why they're not. What determines the privileges of an amateur station? The frequency authorized by the frequency coordinator, the frequencies printed on the license grant, the highest class of operator license held by anyone on the premises, or the class operator license held by the control operator. That one is going to be D. Now, why, what makes this kind of a, a neat thing? Let's say that uh, you're out on uh, field day. This is a, a good example. Uh, field day is, a, is an event we do every year. We just had it uh, a month ago. And you as a technician can actually operate on HF for the purpose of the contest uh, as long as the control operator is there and they can take control. So you as a technician could get on HF, not the extra portions at all, but any of the general class or the technician class areas, uh, you could you could get on there as long as the, the, uh, the control operator is there to take control just in case. Pretty cool thing. When under normal circumstances, may a technician class licensee be the control operator of a station operating an amateur extra class band segment? Uh, no time when designated as the control operator by an extra class licensee as part of a multi-operator contest team or when using a club station whose trustee is an amateur extra class operator licensee. Um, technician at no time, even uh, during contesting or you know, special events or, or whatever, a technician cannot be on extra class band segments at all, period. Uh, what is an amateur station's control point? We talked about this, the location of the station's transmitting antenna, the location of the station's, let me, let me try that again, the location of the station's transmitting apparatus uh, the location at which the control operator function is performed or the mailing address of the station licensee. So what is the amateur station's control point? It's going to be the location in which the control operator function is performed. Which of the following is an example of automatic control? Repeater operation, controlling, uh, or basically remote, controlling the station over the internet, using a computer or other device to send CW automatically, or using a computer or other device to identify automatically. So an example of automatic control, it's going to be repeater operation. And you will find repeaters everywhere. And you know, even uh, in the most remote of places, you will oftentimes find a repeater under automatic control. Uh, which of the following is an example of remote control as defined in part 97? Repeater operation, operating the station over the internet, 
Uh, controlling a model aircraft, boat, or car by amateur radio, or D, all of these choices are correct. The so remote control, as defined in Part 97, is going to be operating the station over the Internet. Um, I will say this. You, you may have noticed there's a lot of all these choices are correct in these, these questions. Um, don't be surprised if that is not the answer in probably 90%. Um, that's just something that I've, I've noticed over the years is a lot of times the, all of these choices is not, is, is not the, uh, the proper one. So just throwing that out there. Which of the following are required for remote control operation? The control operator must be at the control point. The control operator is required at all times. The control operator must be indirectly must indirectly manipulate the controls, or all of these choices are correct. So, which of the following are required for remote control operation? This is going to be all of them. Well, D. There we go. <laughs> D is the is the correct one this time. Uh, who does the FCC presume to be in the control operator of an amateur station unless documented to unless documentation to the contrary is in the station? Uh, the station custodian, the third party participant, the uh, person operating the station equipment or the station licensee. Uh, so they're just going to automatically automatically assume that the station licensee is the control operator unless there's some uh something in the file that says other otherwise in which of the following circumstances may the control operator of an amateur station receive compensation for operating that station this one uh we talked about when the communication is related to the sale of amateur equipment by the control operator's employer when communication is incidental to a classroom instruction at the educational institution, when the communication is made to obtain emergency information for a local broadcast station, or all of these are correct. Uh, so the following circumstances, they may receive it as part of classroom instruction, uh, teaching a class and a technician class, general class, extra class as part of classroom instruction at an institution. Who is accountable for if a repeater inadvertently retrans communications, retransmits communications that violate the FCC rules? Uh, the control operator of the origination station, or origination station, the control operator of the repeater, the owner of the repeater, or both the originating station and the repeating station. Who is accountable if it inadvertently retransmits? It's going to be the control operator of the origination station because the repeater hears and it repeats that's that's all it does it just hears one in one ear repeats out out the out the other out the mouth um and so the person who's actually sending the communications that violate that could be music that could be uh commercial broadcasting whatever uh the control operator the originating station where that is being transmitted from is going to be re uh, responsible for that Okay, we're going to go on to seven, uh, group four. This is going to be mind the rules, mind the rules. Um, okay. Transmission of language that may be considered indecent or obscene is absolutely prohibited. Is there a list of things that are prohibited? N no. There's there's really not, but it's the it takes the social norms of, you know, you don't want to get on there and start, you know, cussing up a storm or, you know, using indecent language. Basically, if uh, if it's you wouldn't say it to your kids or your your grandkids or uh, your family or you know in your church or whatever, you know, it's generally advisable not to to say it on the radio. Let's keep it uh, let's keep it keep it friendly. At no time is intentionally interfering with another amateur radio station ever permitted. So you you let's just say you've made some uh, some enemies. Hope that doesn't happen, but let's just say it, it has happened and 
you hear that person on the radio and they're talking to somebody else and you start transmitting over them and you're interrupting their their conversation that's willfully and intentionally interfering and that can get you that's one of the big things that uh the FCC will nail you for and they they do and they have um just nailed you know fine and in the fines they find people for doing that kind of stuff and it's a process um and it's very well documented so it's you know let's keep it friendly let's uh you know we're trying to, to enhance goodwill here so transmissions intended for reception by the general public is called broadcasting in the fcc rules in the amateur service you cannot transmit to the public directly to the public in amateur radio we don't broadcast that's not what we do um i mean our our signal you would think it is broadcasting but not everybody has an amateur receiver like as if you know it was in their car or something like that so we don't broadcast we we just we transmit you know person to person generally amateur radio stations may engage in one-way transmissions intended for reception only by radio amateurs when transmitting code practice, information bulletins, or transmissions necessary to provide emergency communications. Um, assuming no other means are available, amateur stations are authorized to transmit signals related to broadcasting, uh, programming production, or news gathering, and which communications directly relate to the immediate safety of human life or protection of property. Um, let's read a little bit in a little bit more into that. Uh, when no other means are available, if, if the news is on the air, that's another mean. If uh, a radio station is still on the air, that doesn't authorize you to do a, you know, a retransmit of, of anything. when there is, you know, when the, when the sky falls and there is no other, other, you know, system out there except for amateur radio then you you could re, you know broadcast a program or production or news gathering uh to for the for the benefit of uh human life or protection of property so no other means available that's the critical part critical part excuse me transmitting transmissions of codes or ciphers that hide the meaning of a message is allowed uh by amateur stations only when transmitting control commands to Space stations or radio control craft. So you are not allowed to encrypt um, your communications um, using codes as it, not not like ten codes that are generally available. But if you use some sort of a a code when you speak, because you're trying to hide something, you're trying to hide a a me a meaning of something. That's when it's uh, not allowed. I mean, that's that would. If you're if you're taking a a code to hide a meaning, you are technically ciphering that. So, um, you know you're you're encrypting that. So that's not allowed except when remote control remote controlling a space station or a radio control craft. That way, everybody and their brother doesn't hear the the what it takes to actually power on a a amateur satellite or you know something like that or take take control of it a uh a remote control craft while it's in the middle of flight there is one time that is authorized to transmit music um uh, on the amateur bands at no times if you're going to be in your car and you're going to talk to somebody turn your music down because that is uh, strictly against the role, the, the rules. Um, AFCC will zing you for that if if they hear it. Um, so the only time it's music is allowed to transmit music. Let me try it again. An amateur station is authorized to transmit music is when it's kind of uh, it, it's like background to um, spacecraft communications or retransmission. It might be in the background because they were singing in the background while somebody was talking. That is the only time that it's that it's uh, it's okay to be transmitting music on amateur band is when it's um, incidental to manned spacecraft communications. 
Uh, amateur radio operators may use their stations to notify other amateurs of the available equipment for sale or trade when the equipment is formally used in amateur station and such activity is occasional and not conducted on a regular basis. So you can list your, uh, let's say you have a radio that you know, you pull out of a box and you're like, I'll never use this again. I just want to sell it. It is okay to get on the radio and say, I have a, a Yezu, you know, one, two, three handheld that I would like to sell. I don't use it again. It works just fine. If you're interested, you know, contact me. That is okay. The actual business deal of saying, okay, I will give you a hundred dollars for it or, I'll, or whatever that transaction is. That's what you want to take offline. But as far as listing your equipment, um, that's perfectly fine. We call them um, swap nets. Couldn't think of it there. We call them swap nets, and a lot of repeaters will have a dedicated swap nets once a month, every you know couple of months or something like that, just for to put that information out there. Somebody wants to sell something. Uh, the station licensee must take the station and its record, make the station and its records available for FCC inspection at any time upon request by an FCC representative. Okay. When I've done this class in the past, this has stirred up a lot of controversy. If the FCC shows up at your house, they are there to see your equipment. As part of getting your license, uh, your, your ham license, is agreeing that if the FCC were to show up at your house because they suspect that you have some sort of, you're causing some sort of interference, you're causing some something, something, and they want to inspect your equipment, you have to let them do that. Now, if they show up, you know, you've got guys in suits who are claiming to be the FCC, and they say we're we're the FCC. We want to see your your radio equipment, and you're like, eh, I don't think so. I don't I don't know who you are. You can say, let stay here. I'm gonna call the police, and when they get here, then I will let you. Don't deny them from seeing your equipment. That is, they're not there to to look at your you know your your. Uh, your TV or your, you know, whatever, they are there to look at your equipment for some reason. Um, and so if you have any doubt, just call the police and say, hey, I've got two guys. They look like, uh, you know, they're, they're, in, they're in black suits and black glasses. They look like government people, but I don't know who they are. Can y'all send somebody out? Usually the, uh, the uh, FCC agents will be like, you know, that's fine. Not a problem, but they will want to see your equipment. And if you, don't show it to them, then that will add add to the building of the case against you for whatever whatever's going on. So if they show up, I've never I have heard uh, in enforcement actions where they an FCC representative will show show up to inspect equipment because somebody is just causing all kinds of havoc on the air. So FCC shows up. Either let them in to look at your equipment or, you know, to, hey, let me call the police because I don't know who you are for real and, you know, go from there. Revocation of the station license or suspension of the operator license may be the result if the FCC is not able to reach you by email. Usually, in my experience, if the FCC needs to get a hold of you, they're going to send you a letter in the mail. I have never received a letter from the FC or an email from the FCC for anything. I have received letters in the mail just hey your your license is about to expire. I've never not a not any kind of enforcement thing, but if for some reason that mail bounces back to them and it, it's return mail, your license will more than likely be suspended at least. Um, if they try again and they can't get it, then they will move to cancel your, your license. So make sure that your mailing address, that can be a post office box. That can be your outside mailbox, whatever, wherever you receive email, excuse me, mail, um, just make sure that you can receive it that way. 
you know, even with email, it makes sure it doesn't bounce because they want the only reason they're going to reach out to you is they have a question of some sort. And if they can't get a hold of you, they will take enforcement actions to suspend or cancel your license. Revocation of the station license or suspension of the operator license is possible when this correspondence from the SEC is returned undeliverable because the grantee failed to provide the correct email address, or email or mail address also. So we're still in mind the rules. We're going to uh, take some questions here from the book. What, if any, are the restrictions concerning transmission of language that may be considered indecent or obscene? The FCC maintains a list of words that are not permitted to be used in amateur frequencies. Any such language is prohibited. The ITU maintains a list of words that are not permitted to be used on amateur frequencies, or there's there's no such prohib prohibition. Well, there is no formal list of words but you know in a in a decent society you know you kind of know what what to say and what not to say i'll just put it that way uh when is willful interference to another amateur station permitted stop an um to stop another amateur station which is breaking the rules at no time when taking a short test making a te short test transmission or at any time, stations in the amateur radio service are not protected from willful interference. Um, willful, willful interference is accepted at no time. That's one of the things that the FCC will, they will and have come after people for doing. Um, <laughs> if you're going to use willful interference to stop another amateur station, which is breaking the FCC rules, you're breaking the rules. So... Just don't do it. At, at no time is the proper answer. Uh, how does the FCC define broadcasting for the amateur service? It's a two-way transmission by amateur stations. Any transmission made by the licensed station. Uh, transmission of messages directly directed only to amateur operators or transmissions intended for reception by the general public. How does the FCC define broadcasting? That's going to be D. Transmissions intended for reception by the general public. And as I said, most people don't have um, amateur radio receivers in their house. So it's messages are generally not intended for just anybody. Under which of the following certain circumstances are one way transmission by an amateur station prohibited? In all circumstances, broadcasting in uh, international Morse code practice. Uh, or telecommand or transmissions of telemetry. Broadcasting. We don't, we just don't broadcast. Uh, when may amateur stations transmit information in support of broadcasting, in support of a broadcasting pro production or news gathering, assuming no means, no other means are available? Uh, when such communications are directly related to the immediate safety of human life or protection of property, when per broadcasting communications to or from the space shuttle or non-commercial programming is gathered and supplied exclusively for the National Public Radio Network, or DNEVER. Um, only when such communications are directly related to the immediate safety of human life or protection of property. Uh, when is it permissible to transmit messages encoding encoded to obscure their meaning? Con during contest, only when receiving certain approved digital codes, only when transmitting control commands to space stations or radio control aircraft, or never. You don't encrypt your message or encipher them in just for the sake of... Uh, uh, obscuring them. So only when transmitting controls that commands to space stations or radio control aircraft. That way you can't have a hostile takeover of of the craft. Under what conditions is an amateur station authorized to transmit music using a phone emission? Uh, when in incidental to authorized retransmission of manned spacecraft communications, when the music produces no spurious emissions, when transmissions are limited less than three minutes per hour, 
uh, and when the music is transmitted above 1280 megahertz. So that one's going to be if it's in the background of a spacecraft communications. That's the only time. Uh, when, may, when may amateur radio operators use their stations uh, to notify other amateurs of the availability of equipment for sale or trade? Never. Uh, B, when the equipment is not the personal property of the station licensee or the control operator or their close relatives. Uh, when no profit is made on the sale or when selling amateur equipment and not on a regular basis. That one we talked about, uh, it's going to be when selling amateur radio equipment only and not on a regular basis. That could be a, a hand ra handheld radio, mobile, a desktop, or antenna. Amateur radio equipment is the uh, is the key there. When must the station and its records be available for FCC inspection? Anytime 10 days after a notification by the FCC of such an inspection, at any time upon request by an FCC representative, at any time after written notification by the FCC of such inspection, and only when presented with a valid warrant by an FCC official or government agent. So this one is at any time upon request of an FCC representative. As I said, if you are not doing anything wrong, you are not causing any kind of problems, the FCC will never show up at your door. I've, I've been a ham operator for 23 years, 24 years, and I've never had the FCC show up at my door. But I mind the rules and, you know, don't don't uh, try to create problems. What may happen if the FCC is unable to reach you by email? Fine and suspension of the operator license, revocation of the operator of the station license, or suspension of the operator license, revocation of of access to the license record in the FCC system, or nothing. There's no no requirement. If they can't reach you by email or mail revocation of the station license or suspension of the operator license will occur. If it's suspended, then you might be able to get your license back. If it's rev revocated, if it's been uh, uh, revocation has happened to your license, if they allow you to get a new license, you'll have to start at the bottom and, and work your way back up. Which of the following can result in revocation of the station license or suspension of the operator license? Uh, failure to the inform to inform the FCC of any changes in the amateur station following performance of an RF safety environmental evaluation. Uh, failure to provide and maintain a correct email address with the FCC. Failure to ob ob obtain FCC type acceptance prior to using a home built transmitter or failure to have a copy of your license available at your station. That one is going to be B, failure to provide and maintain correct email address with the FCC, as we said. Okay, let's see here. We are, uh, I think we're, we may be a little bit behind, so we'll uh, work on uh, chugging along here. We're gonna go into tech technician frequencies. Uh, what they are, how they work, you know, basically uh, one of the critical parts of amateur radio. Uh, okay, so the abbrevi abbreviation RF refers to radio frequency signals of all types. Um, this could be megahertz, gigahertz, um, you know, anything along those lines, anything that's an electromagnetic wave. The two components of a radio wave are electric and magnetic fields. If you look at this, the uh, electric field goes up and down, up and down. In a sine wave, the magnetic field goes left and right, left and right in a, in a sine wave. The relationship between the electric and magnetic fields of an electromagnetic wave is that they are at right angles. That's the important thing. They, they function at right angles to each other. <clears throat> so a radio wave travels throughout free space at the speed of light. If you look at this, this is going to give you an idea of how um, how this is this works. So if you hold your hand up 
you point up. Um, you have your other finger pointing another direction, and then like this, this is you can you can actually simulate a, how a radio wave works. This will be your carrier. This will be your magnetic wave, and then this one will represent your electromagnetic wave. So that's one way that you can you can picture that. Uh, once a uh, magnetic electromagnetic magnetic wave hits the antenna to be transmitted, it radiates as if you were to touch, put your finger in a water, and that's what this shows down here. Put your finger in a water, and it will just, it's like a, a water, a ripple in a water, just that it expands out like that. The approximate velocity of a radio wave as it travels through free space is 300 million meters per second. I want you to, to memorize that 300. You don't have to worry about the 300 million, but 300 is going to turn out to be a critical number that uh, you will use well more than one time uh, in your amateur um, uh, amateur career, I guess you would say. So the frequency is the term to describe the number of times a second that an AC current or alternating current makes a complete cycle. So in this case, the period is it starts down uh, in the low frequency and also the uh, high frequency wave. That line going right, that's going to be your time, but your actual the period of your uh, the frequency is when it's low and it goes up high or and then back down or the other way to high, low, high. So that uh, that's going to be the 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 uh, the number of times that that happens in a given time, usually one second, will give you your frequency. The unit of frequency is the hertz. So that up that uh, you know the up and back down. Uh, to complete that period, that's going to be one hertz. A kilohertz is the abbreviation. Uh, the KHZ is the proper abbreviation for kilohertz. MHZ is the abbreviation for megahertz. Um, so you kind of, the way you think about this also, um, 335, 3,525 kilohertz is also the same thing as 3.525 megahertz. It just depends on how you want to read that or how it's, you know, if there are, if there were three more zeros at the end of the uh, 3525 in the front right there, that would be the same thing as, as 3.525 megahertz. So there is a little bit of conversion there that uh, you might have to do just at times. The Property of radio waves is often used to identify the different frequency bands and is called the approximate wavelength in meters. All right. So the wavelength of a radio wave has the relationship to the frequency that the wavelength gets. The wavelength gets shorter as the frequency increases. So the higher in frequency you go, the shorter that wavelength gets. The lower you go, the longer it gets. Uh, the formula for converting frequency is the approximate wavelength in meters. Remember, I said number 300. So your frequency in megahertz is going to equal 300 divided by the wavelength. 300 divided by the wavelength. Uh, if you want to find out the frequency, if you want to know how long my wavelength is, if I'm going to be on the two meter, if I'm going to be on the 10 or the the 80 member, 80 uh, um, 80 meter band, and I want to know what the frequency is. I take that wavelength, and I say 300 divided by the frequency, and that will give you how many how many meters long, or what what uh, what band you're on as far as the uh, the meters, and then also the frequency. So that's a um, that's a pretty neat little way to uh, to think about that. But that 300 number is a is going to be another one of those uh, critical critical things. And there it is. Um, like I said, in the frequency equals 300 divided by wavelength, or wavelength equals 300 divided by frequency to get the actual frequency that you're on. <clears throat> So high frequency, called HF, extends from 3 
to 30 megahertz. 3 to 30 megahertz. That is uh, generally a, a where we operate as amateur radio operators. There are some a little bit lower than that, but HF, typically when we talk about HF, 3 to 30 megahertz is what we are, are talking about. So the maximum peak envelope power output for a technician class operator using their assigned portion of the HF bands is 200 watts. You do get a little bit, as a technician, you do get a little, just a little sliver of 10 meters that you can you can play on. It's very, very, very small. So the maximum power that you can transmit out of your radio, out of your radio, is 200 watts. PEP out of, is going to be the radio, the actual power out of your radio. Um, v, VHF, very high frequency. That is going to go from 30 to 300 megahertz. And you will oftentimes just, you'll hear it called VHF or, or UHF. You know, we're in, in, uh, ham life. We, we like our acronyms. And so, you know, VHF is easy. So that's what, what we'll call it. But that is three, excuse me, 30 megahertz to three megahertz. That's a standard number, regardless where you, where you go. UHF or ultra high frequency goes from 300 megahertz to 3000 megahertz or three gigahertz if you want to think of it that way uh, that includes our 70 centimeter 30 33 centimeter 23 centimeter um and i can't remember what else is is there but we have a lot of a lot of bandwidth in there that we can uh, uh talk or experiment or do whatever you know, you would like in there. So UHF or ultra high frequency is 300 to 3000 megahertz. When you're transmitting the maximum power output, peak envelope power output that you can uh, transmit for any trans for any amateur radio operator is that's technician or, or any of them is going to be 1500 Watts. That's the maximum that you can, uh, transmit above it says above 30 megahertz but that's actually that is our our maximum limit is 1500 watts for most bands uh, 52.525 megahertz is within the six meter band and so this is an example of a uh, of a band chart you can find those um on uh, the ARRL, ARRL's webpage, you can find them. Uh, some, I think ICOM has a band chart, but this is kind of what it looks like. And it will tell you what you can do, uh, like FM simplex or repeaters or CW or, or whatever it is. That's what that will look like. That's what 52.525 looks like on this uh, this chart here. 146.52, 146.52 megahertz. That is our what we call our talk channel on two meter. Um, think of it as uh, channel 19, national calling frequency is what it's called. Um, it's right right on that list there. It's um, everybody has as permissions. You can use sideband. You can use FM simplex, um, and so. Again, this is what it will look like on a uh, on a a band a band chart or band map. So the national calling frequency, as I said, for FM simplex on two meters is one forty six five two. Uh, we have a two what we call a two twenty um, band. This is going to be this this band is actually broken up. It's two nineteen and two twenty. And then I think it is 222 to 225. I may not be right, but I think that's that's right. Um, that is another band that you can get on there and you can talk on and 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 do digital uh, messaging forwarding systems. So there are limitations for emissions on frequencies between 219 and 220. So when you look at the um, at a band chart, let me 
when you look at this band chart here, this is one that uh, it's pretty standard. Usually the very first 100 kilohertz of every band is designated for Morse code. CW is what we call that is Morse code. Um, <clears throat> this is a voluntary guideline for using different modes and activities because there's more than just FM talking. There's um, FM, there's sideband, there's uh, high speed data, there's uh, you can do moon bounce, you can do there's there's so many different things that you can do, but generally that first 100 kilohertz of every band is a is designated CW. Like I said, this is a a voluntary guideline. Um, I mean you you don't have to if you get down there and you transmit in you know, phone in the CW areas, you may have a lot of people mad at you, but the FCC is not going to come after you because they they give you the frequencies and the band plan is put together by volunteers. So um, just keep that in mind. Band plan is volunteers and the beginning of every every band is a CW only band, a CW only area. Amateurs may find non-amateur stations in restricted segments of bands where the amateur service is secondary and must avoid interfering with them. Let me give you an example. The 440 um, band, the 440 megahertz band, 70 centimeters, amateur radio is secondary on that service. The U.S. military in the United States has primary. And so if you're on there and you hear what is clearly not another you know amateur and it, it could be military you do not interfere with them i mean it's just say if, if you hear something on there go somewhere else that way you're not interfering with them because you are secondary and they have priority and you could technically get in trouble i mean that's that's just how how a you know secondary must um just how you must uh, operate around that. It's not good practice to set your transmit frequency and be on exactly on the edge of an amateur band or sub band. And I will tell you why. These, some of these examples here, um, the reason that you don't want to be exactly on a sub band is because, um, so if you're looking at your, your your VFO on your radio or your your screen on your radio and it says let's say um 140 148.000 that is the center point of your frequency that frequency actually will extend out 20 you know 12 and a half kilohertz each side of that and so you will be technically transmitting outside of your uh band limits and so you you want to stay away from the edge. You want to you know find out what band you're on. Are you FM? Are you sideband? Make that determination and then make the adjustment to where you're not going to be transmitting outside of your your uh, your band. Uh, this allows for calibration error in the transmitter frequency display. You want uh, you might hear you might even hear like you go to push up uh, transmit on on the edge and it may it may beep at you or bonk you or something like that. Um, as I said, the modulation sidebands, you know, they, what you're seeing is the center point of your frequency, but there's actually a larger, larger, larger uh, part of the, uh, the frequency that would be going out of band. Um, and then this will also allow, allow for your transmitter frequency drift. If you have a, uh, a com a computer a, um, a radio that you know you your your radio may drift or something like that. So stay away from the the sub band edges. Um, that way you don't actually transmit outside of the uh, of the band. Some questions here. What does the abbreviation RF mean? Uh, radio frequency signals of all types, the resonant frequency of a tuned circuit, the real frequency transmitted as opposed to the apparent frequency, or the re uh, reflective force of an antenna transmission line. 
reflective force. I like that. But the answer is actually radio frequency signals of all types. What are two components of a radio wave? Impedance and reactance, voltage and current, electric and magnetic fields, or ionizing and non-ionizing radiation? Kind of jump the gun on that one a little bit. Electric and magnetic fields, and that's where you can, you know, there's your electric, there's your uh, your mag, no, 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 uh, your magnetic, and that'll give you an idea of the 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 magnetic and uh, electric waves. What is the relationship between the electric and magnetic fields of an electromagnetic wave? Uh, they travel at different speeds. They are in parallel. They revolve in opposite directions, or they are at right angles. Answer going to be they're at right angles to each other. What is the velocity of a radio wave traveling through free space? Speed of light, speed of sound. Speed, the speed is inversely proportional to its wavelength. Its speed increases as the frequency decreases. Trying to trick you there, but the answer is it's going to travel at the speed of light. What is the approximate velocity of a radio wave in free, free space? 150,000, 300 million meters per second, 300 me million miles per hour, or 150,000 miles per hour. Trying to trick you there, it seems. 300 million meters per second. Zippy. All right. What describes the number of times per second that an alternating current makes a complete cycle? Pulse rate, speed, wavelength, or frequency? That's that up, up, down. You know, you start up. How many of those per second? That's going to give you your frequency. What is the unit of frequency? We said that earlier. And that is going to be the Hertz. The Henry, the Farad, and those are different. The Tesla is something different. So the Hertz is going to be the unit of frequency. Tricky one here. What is the abbreviation for kilohertz? Look very, very carefully there. They, they look like they could all be right, but only one can be the winner. All capital, all lowercase, lowercase, and then HG, or lowercase H, then lowercase C. The proper one is going to be D, kilohertz. Hertz, H-Z, is capital H, lowercase Z, so kilohertz. What is the abbreviation for megahertz? It's going to be the, kind of the same way, M-H, no, M-H lowercase mhz or capital m capital hz the proper one is going to be capital mh lowercase z all right which is equal to 3.25 megahertz we talked about that earlier which one would that be it's going to be a little math shift that number that that decimal point around a little bit. The proper answer for 3.525 megahertz is going to be 3525 kilohertz. All right. In addition to frequency, which of the following is used to identify amateur radio bands? The approximate wavelength in meters, the traditional letter, number, designator, channel numbers, or all of these are correct. In addition to frequency, which of the following is used to identify radio bands? You're going to hear most oftentimes um, wavelengths in meters, 75, 80 megahertz, 60, or excuse me, meters, 60 meters, uh, 40, 30, 20 meters. Now, you will hear sometimes um, in the upper, like 440, well, you'll oftentimes hear people just say 440 because it's easier to say 440 is 70 centimeter. So can be referred to as, as both. What is the relationship what is the relationship between wavelength and frequency? 
The wavelength gets longer as their frequency increases. The wavelength gets shorter as the frequency increases. Their, their wavelength and frequency are unrelated, or the wavelength and frequency increase as path length, path length increases. The relationship is going to be the wavelength gets shorter as the frequency increases. So the higher you go, the shorter it gets. The lower you go, the longer it gets. That's why we call it like 80 meters, and that's on uh, 35, 3.5 megahertz. What is the formula for converting a frequency to approximate wavelength in meters? Wavelength in meters equals frequency in hertz multiplied by 300. Wavelength in meters equals frequency in hertz divided by 300. Whew. Wavelength in meters equals frequency in megahertz divided by 300. Or wavelength in meters equals 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz. So looking closely at that one, that one's going to be D. The wavelength in meters equals 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz. All right, what is the frequency range as, as referred to as HF? 300 to 3,000, 30 to 300, 3 to 30, 300 to 3,000 kilohertz. Which one of those looks right? It's going to be 3 to 30 megahertz. That's what we call HF. What is the maximum peak envelope power output for technician class operators in their HF band segments? Who remembers that one? Technicians get 200 watts in their HF band segments. That's the, the max. Everybody else gets 1,500 watts. What frequency range is referred to as VHF? 30 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz? 30 to 300 megahertz, 300K to 3,000K, 300 megahertz to 3,000 megahertz. Which one of those is a VHF? They're all something, but the proper answer is 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. 30 megahertz to megahertz, 300 megahertz. Okay. What is the frequency range? What frequency range is referred to as UHF? 30 to 300 kilohertz, 30 to 300 megahertz, 300 to 3,000 kilohertz, or 300 to 3,000 megahertz. A lot of them look close, but the proper answer is D. 300 to 3,000 megahertz, 300 to 3,000 megahertz, or 3 gigahertz. Those are the same. Except for some specific restrictions, what is the maximum peak envelope power output for a technician class operator using frequencies above 30 megahertz? 50, 100, 500, or 1500 watts? Correct answer is going to be 1500 watts. That's going to be the maximum for any class. Um, some some of the uh, the bands will stipulate, you know, 50 watts or, or something special, but for the most part, it is 1,500 watts across the board. Which frequency is within the 6-meter band? So how do we find this out? we got 6 meters. We want to find out the frequency. So let's take um, the frequency. Excuse me, the 6-meter divided by 300. That's going to give you um, 300 divided by 6. going to give you about roughly 50 ish it's it's not an exact number it's it's 50, about 52 525 five. that's going to be the six meter band some of these frequencies you just there's there's no shortcut to it you just have to you just have to learn it um you know flashcards or whatever which uh amateur band includes one four to six point five two megahertz a very very common band um usually it's it's mobile um the proper answer 14652 is going to be on the two meter band if you take 300 divided by 14652 it will give you roughly 2.1 something we just round to two two meter band 
What is the national calling frequency for FM simplex operation in the two meter band? National calling frequency for FM simplex operations in the two meter band. Well, let's establish which one is the two meter. Is that going to be A or B? Uh, C or D? That's going to be A or B. So one of those. Um, and then more specifically, 146.52 is going to be your call frequency. So those are just something that you um, you might want to just kind of pack in the back of your brain or put on some flashcards and go over it. 146.52 um, is going to be the two meter band. All right. How many amateurs, how may amateurs use the 219 to 220 megahertz section of the 1.25 meter band? What was one of those methods? Spread spectrum, fast scan, emergency, or fixed digital message forwarding systems? The answer is going to be fixed, digi fixed digital message forwarding systems only. Um, let me let me go back one here. Spread, spread spectrum and fast scan, those use, the reason that those are not right, those just use too much bandwidth. And, um, for the for the actual band itself, you have to have too much information for that band. So fixed digital message forwarding systems only, like a pager. Uh, what is a band plan uh, beyond the privileges established by the FCC? Uh, it's a voluntary guideline for using different modes or activities within the amateur band, a list of operating schedules, a list of available net frequencies, or a plan devised by a club to indicate frequency band usage. So the FCC makes the rules. They tell us where we can operate, what what bands we can operate, but the band plan is a voluntary guideline. Um, large groups of hams have come together, like the ARL and other other groups. Um, frequency coordinators have all come together to put together a band plan to make things most efficiently. That includes like uh, the first 100 kilohertz is going to be for. CW, and then this part could be for FTA, then this next part could be for sideband, the next part could be for FM and repeaters and so on and so on. So that's that's what they did. The FCC gives us gives us the uh, the spectrum, and then we volunteers break it up to make it the most uh, beneficial and useful. Uh, how are USN amateurs restricted in segments of bands where amateur radio op radio service is secondary? U.S. amateurs may find non-amateur stations in those segments and must avoid interfering with them. U.S. amateurs must give foreign amateur stations priority in those segments. International communications are not permitted in those segments, or digital transmissions are not permitted in those portions. So how do we handle sec being secondary? U.S. amateurs may find non-amateur stations on those segments, Let's let's just avoid them. Let's not challenge them. You don't need to know if they're military. They could the they could be somebody out there just causing interference, but you don't know. Just assume that it, you know it's it's whoever has priority and, and move on. Uh, why should you not set tra your transmitter frequency to be exactly at the edge of an amateur subband? This will allow for calibration error in the transmitter frequency display. It'll just give you an error or uh, so the modulation sidebands do not extend beyond the band edge. So you don't go over your allowed frequency uh, to allow for transmitter frequency drift. So if you have a, a transmitter that drifts higher and then lower, you don't accidentally go out or D all of these above. All three of those are going to be correct. All of them are correct. Oh, there it goes. D is the correct answer. There it goes. This is fun. Um, okay. I have uh, I have a short break on here uh, for everybody to stand up, stretch your legs, get a drink, run to the restroom. Um how about we take about, uh, I don't know, maybe five, ten minutes, and then uh, we can pick up. We're, we're roughly about halfway there. There's a lot of information tonight. Um, so uh, we'll just take a short break and then uh, resume here shortly. Sounds good, man. I'll take it and just uh, let me know when you're back. Okay. Cool. 
Well, like I uh, like I said earlier, you guys uh, you guys can put your questions in the chat if you want to, if you need to get up yourself and go take a short break. Of course, do that. Um, and um, Chris will be back in a minute. And I'm seeing a lot of really good uh, interactions in the chat when he gets to the question section. A lot of people coming in there and saying um, answering uh, A, B, C, and D. So that's good. I appreciate you guys uh, participating like that. Uh, someone did come in there earlier and asked. He thought it was the general test because the general question pool just updated earlier this month. Every question pool updates at on July 1st of every year. So what they do is last year, 2022, they updated the technician question pool on July 1st. This year, it'll be the, it was the general question pool on July 1st. Next year, it'll be the extra question pool on July 1st. And then the following year, they take a year off. So it's three three license uh, classes updated once every four years. And then in 2027, did I do my math right there? 2027? Six, yeah, 2027. Or no, 2026, the technician pool will update again in three years from now. So it's been out for about a year, and uh, it'll update again in, in 2026, once every four years. Let me take a moment here to uh, to make some suggestions to you folks who might be new to the amateur radio scene uh, about because uh, I get this question all the time. I've had this channel for about eight and a half years. I welcome you to join us, and uh, we live stream every Sunday night. We live stream most weeks on Wednesday evening, not every week on Wednesday or not or Wednesday at noon, I should say. Lunchtime live stream Wednesdays at noon. And I upload two to three new videos a week about various things in amateur radio. One of the questions I get most often is, what should I get in my first radio? So i got a couple of suggestions for you. Uh, if you go to bettersaferadio.com, you can pick up one of these. Now, these guys sell GMRS radios as well. If, you've come, if you're coming from the GMRS world, you might have heard of them already. Or if not, you know, go check them out because they have GMRS radios also. But they have this brand new, uh, they have three or four, maybe five different models of ham radios. This is their, kind of their flagship of ham radio right here. It is the, uh, the Waxon, or it's pronounced Ocean or Oshang. You've got about four or five different ways to pronounce that word if you want to. It's a Chinese company. The UV9 Papa X-Ray ham two-way radio and SHTF scanner. It's $199, 8 watts. Dual band, 2 meters and 70 centimeters. Those are two of the bands that Chris was talking about today. And it comes pre-pro... These, th these radios hold 999 memory channels. Well, it comes pre-pro... This is the, the great thing that makes this radio great for newcomers is it comes pre-programmed with about 920, 930 channels already in the radio. That uh, simplex repeaters... Or simplex channels, repeater channels, uh, GMRS channels, which are... Uh, Receive only. You can't transmit on GMRS with this radio. and uh, But it comes with a lot of different ham radio stuff, a lot of police and fire uh, scanner type channels, a lot of uh, business band scanner type, type channels, and it comes with all that already in the radio. You can save a 7% discount on everything on this website with the coupon code of HR2ALL7. HR2 for ham radio 2, all for everything on the website, 7 for 7%. HR2 all, HR2ALL7 will save you a 7% discount on bettersaferadio.com that link to this website and everything else that we talk about today will be in the description below for those of you coming by on, on Team Replay uh, Better Safe Radio is one of the sponsors of the channel he's given me a lot I'm giving away two of these radios this uh, at the beginning of next month and uh, he donated those I did not buy them he donated those so we're going to be giving those away to two different winners and to sign up for that giveaway that uh, link is in the description below as well Gigaparts.com is another amateur radio store. They sell a lot of computer stuff as well. They've got their fingers in two or three different uh, industries: computer uh, support or computer technology stuff. Uh, they sell 3D printers and whatnot. They're getting into to the overlanding world. I have my own page on their site, and everything on this page will save you five percent if you put uh, the coupon code of KC5HWB, which is my call sign my ham radio call sign so you can browse through that page there's three different page three pages of stuff here all about amateur radio and uh pages one two and three you can click on that down at the bottom that link is in the description below as well 
And one of my favorite radios, I mean, just without even without even blinking, I'll tell you, one of my favorite radios is the uh, the Anytone AT878 uh, UV2 Plus. It is a dual band analog and DMR radio. It will hold up to 3,000 channels and I think 500,000 contacts, if I remember correctly correctly it has true aprs beaconing so you can send and receive aprs if you don't know what the aprs is look at some videos on this channel it's something it's a way of reporting your position and sending messages over the air to one another okay that's a very very high level overview of it but this radio would do all of the things like that and it will do dmr and i get a lot of uh i get a lot of people coming into the channel saying hey i i got into ham radio because my buddies were all talking on dmr and you can connect DMR hotspots and repeaters together over the internet very easily. And um, people are talking to each other across state lines, across you know, uh, on in other countries and whatnot, and everything like that. So the um, the Anytone eight seven eight UV two plus is the latest and greatest DMR handheld radio. And Bridgecom Systems does a really good job of supporting the community because if you buy from them, they give you a 150-ish, um, a free 150-ish video course about everything to do with this radio. Uh, you can call them for tech support all the time. They'll help you program it. They'll help you set it up. If you have any troubles with it, they'll get on the phone or get on email with you and, and, and walk you through it. So uh, once again, those are the three um, places that uh, are kind of like, they didn't really sponsor this video. I just decided to share that with you because these are some of the most common questions I get running a ham radio channel and been doing it for about eight and a half years. People who are new to the hobby, new to the ham radio world, uh, these are two, three really good places to start. BetterSafeRadio.com, MyGigaparts page, and BridgecomSystems.com. Again, all the links are in the description below. So thank you to all three of them for supporting this channel and for making uh, ham radio what it is today. So we'll switch back over here and go there. If you guys have any questions, uh, it looks like Arthur's offering to buy someone an IC705. Let me know what you're going to do with that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm teasing him. So IC705 is a really good QRP uh, HF ham radio, but it also includes uh, 2 meters and 440, so you can do repeater stuff with it as well. But yeah. So good deal. All right, uh, Chris, I see you're back in the... You good? Okay. We'll switch back over here. When you are. Okay. Yep. Take it away, man. I appreciate it. And uh, <clears throat> everybody, uh, like I said, watch the question and answer at the end of each section. But if you have a question, go ahead and type it in the chat. We are watching that. So thanks, man. All right. Thank you all for that little break there. All right. So we are uh, we're roughly we're, we're just a little bit over halfway there. Uh, halfway there so we may uh jason we may end up going just a little bit long i hope that's okay um but i'm gonna i'm gonna push through um as quickly as i can without you know causing any kind of missing of information so okay your first radio that is a uh an ex uh, ex you know, exciting thing um once you get your technician license i want to welcome you you will never have any money again um because there's just so much that you can do so uh i hope your you know significant others are okay with that i'm just uh, let me just throw that out there okay so on a radio you have your uh some of the basic functions the ptt the push to talk is what you will find on the side of your radio or on a uh, handheld or on a, uh, a remote mic push to talk um I would say that when that time comes, you're, you're going to be nervous to get on the radio, but, um, you know, think about what you want to say and then just click the push to talk and give your call sign and uh, somebody will come back and answer you. And uh, you never know, you might have long, lifelong friends. All right. So um, there's so many repeaters, so many different simplex channels, so many things that you can do. Uh, one of the most popular ways of storing a memory channel is or storing frequencies is in a memory channel you can oftentimes in the newer radios you can put your frequency in there your offsets your your tones and then give it a name so when you're looking at the actual um 
screen, you know, it says what the repeater is, what whatever you've named it. So that's uh, one way to kind of keep up with everything is is using your memory channels uh, on your radio. A disadvantage of a rubber duck antenna, every in every radio, every HT radio is going to come with some sort of a a an antenna that we call a rubber duck. Um, those those antennas are not they're designed to get you on the air. They will get you on the air, but they are definitely by no means the most efficient uh, antennas out there. I would recommend that you you find a better one. And there's a lot of new new companies, startups out there that are putting out really really good antennas. Um, to and and to the point that um, replacing this antenna could mean getting into a repeater well compared to not getting into it all. So these rubber duck antennas, they do excellent on receive, but they, they are, they are uh, not good at all for transmitting. So once you get a, 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 a radio, say like an HT, I would recommend that you, you find a, an external or third party um, antenna to put on there to replace. Uh, the signals can be significantly weaker when using a rubber duck. And by significantly, we mean significantly. Um, also, um, an, anti, an antenna inside uh, versus outside of your car. Um, if you don't want to get a, a permanently installed radio in your car and you want to use your HT, get some kind of antenna where you can put a magnet on your car or some some somehow to get that antenna outside of the car because that will give you a drastic difference in um, uh, in your signal quality uh, at the receiving end. So an F RF power amplifier is a, uh, a little bit of kit that uh, will take your input, your, your transmit power um, from a handheld radio or a low power mobile radio, and it will amplify it it will make it a it will retransmit at a much higher power um that is one one effective way to increase your range again if you don't want a high power mobile radio this is a, a way to uh help if you're kind of out in rural areas um and don't have very good access to um repeaters so FM or frequency modulation is the most commonly used VHF and UHF repeaters. That is um, almost almost uh, exclusively that is that that you know there's CW and there's sideband, but FM for the most part is is kind of the big. Uh, mode modulation that's that's used on on VHF and UHF. So when you're using a uh, a VHF or UHF repeater, or in this case a VHF repeater, your phone signal is going to be 10 to 15 kilohertz in bandwidth. So the best way I can think of of thinking about bandwidth is thinking about a water hose, and the thickness allows how much water to go through. Now if you compare that to a fire hose, which is usually a lot thicker, you can push more data through a fire hose than you or more water through a fire hose than you can a water hose. That's how kind of this uh, bandwidth picture it like that. Um, your FM signal is 10 to 15 kilohertz wide. And that is how much data that that signal can carry. And so if you 10 to 15 kilohertz, that's that's quite a bit. That's uh, for, for FM. A sideband, I mean, you're looking at three kilohertz. So there's not a whole lot of uh, you know, extra traffic that or extra data that can be carried along. So think of a bandwidth as the wa the size of a, of a water hose and how much water can actually go through it. Think of that water as data. The larger the bandwidth, the more data that can go through. And so the approximate bandwidth of a VHF repeater FM phone is 10 to 15 kilohertz. 
as I was doing my review of this, I actually had a, uh, I ran it. I had a conflict with this. I didn't, this is this, this number is what we're going to go with for the sake of the test. But that is, that is not an actual accurate number right there. Um, but we will talk about that later. I don't want to get too, too deep into this. So the most common type of modul uh, modulation used for VHF packet or data radio transmission is also FM. Um, so if you look at these three charts right here, um, the first one is AM. AM, just like in your car, um, the way that it works down here on the bottom, um, the more information, the tighter or the, the, the larger that uh, the, the sine wave will be. Um, FM kind of compresses in that in the middle, the bottom of the middle. And then digital modul modulation is on off, on off, on off, on off. So it's um, it's more of a square like you see up top there, ones and zeros. So those are uh, the the digital modulation is going to be what you might oftentimes find in packet. FM is what we use in repeaters. AM is sometimes used on on uh, HF radios. It's you know still okay. What is the function of the PTT input? Push to talk. So input for input for a key used to send CW. Uh, B switches transceivers from receive to transmit when grounded. Um, C provides a transmit tuning tone when grounded. Or D input for a preamplifier tuning tone. So a the function of a of a PTT is to switch the transceiver from receive to transmit when grounded. Um, push to talk is is uh, is what that means. You might hear some people say it's not it's push to talk, not push to think. Um, but either way, either way is fine. <laughs> what is a way to enable quick access to a favorite frequency on your transceiver? Um, enable the frequency offset, store it in the memory channel, enable the Vox, or use the scan mode to select the desired frequency. Uh, the easiest way, store it in a memory channel. That way you can just turn the uh, the memory knob and you can go between any number of re you know, repeaters or frequencies in the area. Um, antennas supplied with most handheld radio transceivers compared to a full-size quarter wave antenna. I don't know what that one is. It, has, it, it must be talking about uh, rubber ducks. So maybe rubber duck antenna. It has a very low efficiency. Good for receiving. Does not transmit very well. And it should be replaced just as part of the new radio you know, purchase process. All right. What is the disadvantage of using a handheld VHF transceiver with a flexible antenna inside of a vehicle? The signal strength is reduced due to the shielding effect of the vehicle. The bandwidth of the antenna will decrease, increasing SWR. The SWR might decrease, decreasing the signal strength, or D, all of these are correct. Proper answer is going to be A. Your signal strength is reduced due to the shielding effect of the vehicle. Your vehicle acts like a Faraday cage or a microwave. You know, if you... You turn on your microwave, there's a lot of RF energy in it, but very, very little gets out. Same thing that happens if you use a uh, NHT or a handheld radio in a vehicle. Okay. What device increases the transmitted output power from a transceiver? A voltage divider, an RF power amplifier, an impedance network, or D, all of these choices are correct. So we're going to increase power of the transmitted signal using an RF power amplifier. And they come in all shapes and sizes, all different uh, power outputs. Uh, so you can you can choose your uh, what kind you want if if you need it. Which type of modulation is commonly used for VHF and UHF voice repeaters? 
AM, sideband, SSB, sideband, PSK, or FM, or PM? Answer is going to be FM or PM, frequency modulation or pulse modu modulation. That's the difference between analog and digital. What is the approximate bandwidth of a VHF repeater FM voice signal? Bandwidth of a VHF repeater FM voice signal. 500 hertz, 150 hertz, 10 to 15 kilohertz, or 50 and 125 kilohertz. That's going to be C, between 10 and 15 kilohertz. The, uh, the, the, the small one, the 150 hertz, the CW, I uh, can't remember what 500 is. I believe that was some sort of or TTY maybe or something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but each one of them has its place in, the, uh, in, in our use. What type of modulation is most commonly for VHF packet radio transmissions? VHF packet radio transmissions. FM or PM, SSB, sideband, uh, AM or PSK. So packet radio is sort of a uh, digital, and so that's going to be FM or PM. All right. Our next, our next uh, section is going to be going solo, your first transmission. And this is a... Uh, an exciting time when you actually get into doing this. It's uh, you're for the first time you get on the air. You may have Mike, what we call Mike fright, but I promise you, if you just throw your call sign, somebody will come back and and want to talk to you, get to know you. All right, so going solo. A keypad or VFO knob can be used to enter a transceiver's operating frequency. Um, a lot of frequent or a lot of radios will come with a keypad um, and you'll see, you know, numbers just like as if it was on a, a telephone. This is, this is a, uh, a way to enter in your frequency using the VFO. VFO is basically where you directly enter the frequency that you want to go to compared to a memory mode. So VFO mode or memory mode. VFO, you'd hit that VFO button and you type in, in this case, 146.800, and your radio would tune to that and is ready to uh, talk in the uh, the HF receiver here. You also have a uh, a keypad or you have a VFO knob. HF you generally don't use memory a whole lot. You'll use the the VFO to tune to the frequency that, or manually enter in that you want to go to. Two common ways, very very common ways of using your radios. A uh, squelch, so. I don't know if a lot of y'all growing up uh, when I was little, my very first radio was with one of those little GI Joe radios. It's just plastic and you turn it on and you just constantly hear static. Uh, those radios did not have what we call squelch. Squelch is a way to uh, remove that white nails, nail, the white noise, excuse me, when there's no incoming signal. The benefit of that is you're not just constantly hearing a, you know, um, just a, noise coming from the radio you can you can adjust it up and uh it will um adjust the the receiver to where it will open only right you know, right where where you set it and so you can turn that and it will actually it'll kill out that uh that white noise if uh that you're hearing it will also adjust the squelch adjust the squelch so that weak fm signal can be heard um, the squelch is, a is that threshold that you should set so the receiver output audio is on all the time. It also mutes the receiver uh, noise when there's no sing signal being used. So another another function of the squelch is if you're just right on the edge and you're not able to pick somebody out of the noise, you can turn that squelch down and it will open up the receiver and hopefully you would be able to um, hear what what's you know somebody's trying to tell you. That way, uh, you know you're able to to hear as well as also cancel out that noise that's out there that you may not want to hear. A network of repeaters in which signals repeated 
by one repeater are tran transmitted by all other repeaters in the network describes a linked repeater network. These are very common. Um, I, I grew up listening to them. And I say grew up on my high, high school, my teens, my 20s. It was very, very common to hear linked repeater systems all over the place. And they can be linked in wide areas. Um, now with digital technologies like uh, DMR and Fusion and, and uh, D-Star and things like that on the repeaters, um, it's kind of, it's very commonplace to hear. Uh, let, let me give you like DMR, uh, on DMR we have the Texas Statewide. That will actually activate almost every, almost every, every repeater DMR repeater in the state that has Texas statewide on it. Um, so it's just a way of broadening. Not only are you talking wide area to your local area, but you're also, you're actually spreading out and, and getting a large area going through multiple repeaters. So that's a linked repeater network, very common um, in many areas. Uh, so we have we were talking about repeaters. This is uh, we're going to talk about simplex. Simplex is one one way transmission, one to one um, direct. There's no repeater in the middle. There's no nothing. It's just one car to the next, one hiker to the next. So it's the term used to describe an amateur station that's transmitting and receiving on the same frequency. Um, that. Uh, that's all I love for I love simplex. Um, I think it's I think it's a lot of fun. Um, so stations within range of each other can communicate with simplex channels designated in the uh, VHF and UHF band plans without having to tie up a repeater. So if you can if you're on a car trip, a couple of cars, and you've got hams in each one of them, you know you can you can use simplex radio to talk back and forth to each other on your on your car trip. Um, compared to having to tune into a repeater um, is uh, is another method. So simplex and duplex. When an amateur operator makes an on-air transmission to test equipment or an antenna, please identify. Please identify. That's a, a very important thing. Uh, you'll hear a lot of a lot of times just people keying up the repeater we call it kerchunking 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 and it's like yes you're, you're making it into the repeater they it's just that's just something that people do it is not legal so if you could just you know after 75 kerchunks if you can just say hey it's k5ho i'm testing and then you know keep kerchunking or if, if you have to do that um if you transmit you want to identify because as i said the fcc wants to know who it is that's talking on the radio. Um, the procedural signal CQ means calling any stations. Um, some of the guidelines when you're choosing a frequency to call CQ on. Um, first things first, listen, just listen. See see if you hear anybody. Is there anybody is you know, is there anybody on this frequency that you can hear? Ask if the frequency is used. Hey, it's K five HOI is the frequency in use because uh, when you start getting into the HF, you may have two people talking, and their signal is overshooting you, but you don't hear them. And so, if you keep and say it's the frequency in use, typically somebody will come back and say, "Yeah, hey, we're in a we're in a conversation or a cue." So, um, try you know, see if you can find another frequency. So, is the frequency in use? Make sure that you're in your assigned band. You know, if you're uh, in within your privileges, those are some of the things that uh, you general generally, uh, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you're you're able or you're legal to be in the band that you're in. So, when responding to a station's calling CQ, transmit the other station's call sign followed by yours. Now, if we have any police officers out there, you know this is exactly the opposite. But in ham radio, it's the other station's call sign followed by your call sign. So, if I wanted to call Jason, KD, KC5HWB, it's KD5HLY. That's the process to. Uh, uh, to call somebody as well responding to somebody who's calling CQ. 
So distortion of a signal's audio is the result of tuning an FM receiver above or below a signal's frequencies. So you might be on one frequency and somebody else may be on another frequency. Um, it could be, you know, even if you're, you're both, your dials are both showing, you know, 14 to 30, let's just take an example. Your radio had, there's a chance that your radio may be actually a little bit below frequency and your person you're calling could be above it. So it will actually sound distorted and it's mainly just because you're not exactly on the same frequencies. An appropriate way to call another station on a repeater, if you know the other station call sign, it stays the other station's call sign, and then your call sign. So KC5HTB, KD5HOI. And usually if they're there, then somebody will oftentimes respond. VHF signal strengths sometimes vary greatly when the antenna is moved. Only a few feet due to multipath propagation uh, cancels or reinforces the signature. Um, I have been in the position before where I was talking to somebody driving down the road and I would pull into my house and my house would be in between the repeater and or my house would be in between the repeater. Um, but the repeater was, you know, far away and they could hear or see on their, their, their meter, they could actually see my antenna, uh, swinging back and forth like this. So that's sometimes, you may have to, you know, move just uh, just a couple inches to get a good signal. Sometimes it can it can you know you can run into that issue. But like I said, I've had issues where my antenna was whipping back and forth just because I I had been driving and I parked and it was still doing this and they could hear me fading in and fading out, fading in, fading out, and they called me out on that. So that's um, that just gives you an example of you know sometimes how sensitive radio can be. The rapid fluttering sounds sometimes heard from mobile stations are moving while transmitting. It's called picket fencing. Um, you you might hear somebody, you know, as they're going past light poles or, or they're going through something, they'll fade out, come back, fade in, came, come back. And that's that's the same exact thing that uh, with my antenna was, was going back and forth. It's, we'll call it picket fencing. It's just because as you're going, there's... Yeah, you know, the signal is being blocked uh, partially, and then it comes back, and so we call that picket fencing. When two stations transmitting on the same frequency interfere with each other, no one has the right to the frequency. The stations should should continue to use the frequency. Um, generally, what happens, you will hear two people start talking let's take it on a repeater you will hear two people start talking at the same time and well the the repeater only has one one ear and so it just takes what it hears and combines it and retransmit it and sometimes it can it can be a pretty gnarly sound we call it uh uh super heterodyne and or doubling as another and nobody owns the frequency so Basically, when you stop and you're like, oh, I just I was doubling with the guy. Um, let them finish. And, you know, you could just say, hey, I, I'm sorry, I, I walked on you or I, I doubled with you. Can you say it again? So it's you want to stay, keep it friendly. Nobody owns the frequencies. And so you can't be like, you know, get out of here or whatever. There are a, a few um, signals that we, we call or we have that we we use. We call them uh, Q signals. So uh, QRM is the Q signal that indicates you're receiving interference from other stations. QRM is interference man-made. You have QRN, which is interference nature-made. It could be lightning. Uh, QRM is generally the... Uh, you know, somebody talking on you because they're not hearing you. They just got on a frequency or, or any number of reasons, but they are, you know, causing you not intentional interference. It's kind of accidental, but they don't know it or, or maybe they are doing it intentionally. That's man-made interference or QRM. You'll hear, you'll hear Q signals used quite a bit. Um, another one is QSY. 
So the Q signal indicates you are changing frequency. I personally use QSY all the time. I'll uh, I'll say, hey, I'm I'm going to QSY to another frequency. That's just you don't have to. That's just how I have over the years. I've got into that habit of of saying that. So QSY is changing the frequency. QRM man-made interference. Uh, so a populator, a populator, popular operating activity that involves contacting as many stations as possible during a specific period is called contesting. As with everything else known to man, we can make a contest out of it. And so we we take an amateur radio and that's what we've done. We have made a contest where you contact as many people as you possibly can in a duration. So um with our field day that just came up, it was a 24 hour period. Uh Saturday, 1 a.m., 24 hours till Sunday at uh at at 1 p.m. or 1 p.m. to 1 p.m. Excuse me, 24 hours. And so it, it was a contest. And so that's a very, very con uh common thing. And you will find contest any given time. It doesn't matter when it is, you will always find contest at some somewhere on the dials. When contacting another station in a radio contest, a good procedure is to send only the minimum information needed for the proper identification and the contest exchange. So there, it could, it could be controversial if you just send, you know, the, the last three of your call sign. Um, and going back to you know vanity call signs, if you're going to be a contester, KF5XXX is not going to be a a a very good uh, vanity call sign for you uh, because it's it's long and X is difficult to say. Um, so if you're going to get in there and you're somebody's calling CQ for a contest and you say XXX, they may hear you, but you're you're supposed to give your your full call sign, your full KF5XXX or KD5HIY and not just HIY because that's kind of bad, bad form there. All right, a grid locator. This is a very common thing that uh, uh, if you go to QRZ.com and you look up somebody, uh, you will see their grid locator. Now I am in, I am in EM12. That's in central Texas, but if you're in, let's just say central Arkansas, you may be EM 34, or if you're up in Seattle, it could be, uh, I can't see what this is, CN 97 or something. It's just a a grid that has been overlaid on, on the United States just to kind of say, you know, I'm in this area. Now that is broken down even more into uh, further numbers like uh, let's just take an example like EM33 could be EM33 KR56 and that so that takes a big area narrows it down narrows it down narrows it down so generally whenever you uh, you do a contesting like a, a grid chase is what they will call it you'll you'll give them you know uh, EM12 or or even 12 kt that's that's kind of my area um and so that that way they can look at a map a map and actually see oh okay i see right there north texas is where he, where he's at all right oh goodness which of the following can be used to enter a transceiver's operating frequency um, the keypad or the VFO knob, the CTCSS or DTMF encoder, the auto, uh, automatic frequency control, the AFC, or all of the choices are correct. For our sake here, we're going to use the VFO knob that allows you to just turn or the keypad allows you manually enter in compared to the, the VFO knob. Uh, what is this, the purpose of a squelch function? Reduce the CW's transmitters key clicks to mute the receiver audio when a signal is not present uh eliminate parasitic oscillations in an rf amplifier or reduce interference from an impulse from impulse noise uh, we use a squelch to mute the receiver audio that way we're not just constantly hearing um 
just white noise coming from our radio because that would drive a person insane. Uh, how is the squelch adjusted so that a weak FM signal can be heard? Uh, we set the squelch threshold to a so that a receiver output audio is on all the time. Turn up the audio level until it overcomes the squelch threshold. Um, turn on the anti-squelch function or enable squelch enhancement. We're going to go with A. Um, B, just I wouldn't continue turning up the uh, the audio level because some of these radios get really loud. I would just uh, rely on the squelch there that uh, allows you to open that squelch, hear what you want, and then you can you can turn it back on to quiet. Which of the following describes a linked repeater network? It's a network of repeaters in which signals received by one repeater are transmitted by all the repeaters in the network. A single repeater with more than one receiver or multiple repeaters with the same control operator or a system of repeaters linked by APRS. Proper answer is going to be a network of repeaters connected by the internet, by RF, by Echolink, by any, you know, uh, all-star, by any number of, of things that can be connected together. Uh, what... What term describes an animal amateur station that is transmitting and receiving on the same frequency? You're transmitting and you're listening on the same frequency. What do we call that? Full duplex, diplex, simplex, or multiplex? <clears throat> I call that simplex. Why are simplex channels designated in the UHF and VHF, the VHF and UHF bands? Um, so stations within the range of each other can communicate without tying up a repeater uh, contest operation for working DX only, or so the stations with simple transmitters can access the repeater without automated offset. Proper answer is going to be so that within range of each other, stations within range of each other can, can, can communicate uh, without tying up a repeater. There is a, uh, a, f a specific frequency here in North Texas that I enjoy listening to. It's a, uh, uh, a repeater. It's not, excuse me, it's not a repeater. It's a simplex frequency. And I hear guys in Dallas and Fort Worth and, you know, these guys are not, they're not close and they're running a lot of power, but I can hear them talking on, on simplex and it's really, really fun. Which of the following is required when making on the air test transmissions? Identification of the transmission station, conduct test only between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., notify the FCC of the transmissions, or all of these are correct. We're going to identify the transmitting station. It doesn't matter what time it is, and the FCC could care less if you're doing transmission test transmissions as long as you're identifying. What is the meaning of the procedural uh, signal CQ? Call on the quarter hour, test transmission, no reply expected. Only the called station should transmit or calling any station. You will hear CQ on HF all the time. CQ, 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 calling any station. You don't usually use CQ on repeaters. Let me just throw that out there just for uh, uh, something for you to, to file away in your mind. Uh, you don't generally find CQ being called on a repeater. Uh, what should you do before calling CQ? Listen, uh, listen first to be sure that no one else is using the frequency. Ask if the frequency is in use. Make sure you're in your assigned or your permitted band or all of these choices are correct. Proper answer is A. Also B. Also C, so all of these choices are correct. Listen, listen, listen is the best thing that you can do, first of all. So how should how could how should you respond to a station calling CQ? Uh, transmit CQ followed by the other station's call sign. Transmit your call sign followed by the other station's call sign. Transmit the other station's call sign followed by yours, or transmit a signal report followed by your call sign. In amateur radio, we call theirs before ours. So KC5HDB is KD5HIY. All right, what is the result of running an FM receiver above or below a signal's frequency? 
uh, changing an audio pitch, sideband inversion, generation of a heterodyne tone, or distortion of the signal's audio. Um, running above or below the signal's frequency is actually going to give you distortion. So what is an appropriate way to call another station on a repeater if you know their station's call sign? Say break, break, and then the station's call sign. Say the station's call sign, then identify with your call sign. Say CQ three times, then the other station's call sign. Or wait for the station to call CQ and then answer it. Well, C and D, we don't generally call CQ on a repeater. Um, break, break is something reserved for emergencies. So the proper answer is going to be say the station's call sign, then identify with your call. You're going to call them, then give your call sign. Why do VHF signal strengths come sometimes very greatly when the antenna is moved only a, a few feet? Uh, the signal path encounters different concentrations of vapor. Um, I try not to give these answers away. Um, sometimes I can't. Uh, VHF ion ionospheric propagation is very sensitive to path length. Multipath propagation cancels or reinforces signals or all of these choices are correct. Answer is going to be C. Multipath propagation cancels or reinforces signals. Um, A just you know, vapor that just got me. Okay, what is the meaning of the term picket fencing? Um, alternating transmission during a net operation, a rapid flutter on mobile signals due to multipath propagation, a type of ground system using with system used with vertical antennas, and local versus long distance communications. Uh, it's going to be B. So rapid flutter on a mobile signal due to multipath. Your signal may be going out this way, and then you know. One one part of your signal may be getting to the repeater prior to another, uh, the other one. All right. Which of the following applies when two stations transmitting on the same frequency interfere with each other? The stations should negotiate continued use of the frequency. Both stations should choose another frequency to avoid conflict. Interference is inevitable, so no action is required. Or use set up subaudible tones on both stations so both stations can share the frequency. And we're going to go with A. The station should negotiate continued use of the frequency. Which Q signal indicates that you are receiving interference from other stations? Interference from other stations. So we got QRM, QRN. We didn't talk about QTH or QSB. Um, so QRN is nature made. We're talking about interference from other stations. So QRM for man made. QRM A is the proper answer. Which Q signal indicates that you are changing frequency? QRU, QSY, QSL, QRZ. Um, again, we didn't talk about QRZ, QSL, or QRU which leaves us with QSY. We're going to change the frequency. I don't know. Maybe you can associate the Y with frequency, but uh, QSY is the proper answer. What operating act activity involves contacting as many stations as possible during a, specific, a specified period of time? Simulated emergency exercise, net operations, public service, or contesting? going to be contesting that's a very popular thing lots and lots and lots of people do it lots of awards that you can wear a uh, win from contesting uh which of the following is good procedure when contacting another station on a radio in a radio contest contest uh sign only the last two letters of your call if there are many other stations calling uh contact the station twice to be sure that you are in his log Send only the minimum information needed for proper identification and contest exchange. And uh, D, all of these choices are correct. Proper answer is going to be send only the min minimum information. Going to be your call sign, signal strength, um, usually where you're located, um, and then they will reciprocate that information and you can put it in the log, give them information. You know, if they're very busy, 
they'll just need the the basic information or whatever the the contest requires if it's a uh, if parks on the air, you may have to give them your park information or, you know, something, you know, whatever they're asking for, that's what you give and only the thing that you need to give. What is a grid locator? A letter number designator assigned to a geographic location, a number letter designator assigned to an azimuth and elevation, an instrument for neutralizing a final amplifier, or an instrument for radio direction finding. So well, that sounds right. A grid locator is going to be a letter number designator assigned to a geographic location, just used for helping you locate the person that you uh, uh, that you're contacting. All right, we are at repeaters. So we've talked about simplex uh, quite a bit. You know, that's point to point uh, or you know, person to person or vehicle to vehicle using one frequency to transmit and receive. Repeaters are uh, fun places to, to hang out. You can meet a lot of people on repeaters. Uh, but what are they? Well, if you look at this little cartoon here, it's uh, generally a repeat. A repeater is a um, a station that's in a high area could be on a mountaintop could be on the top of a tall tower could be on a water uh, tower um the one of the big repeaters around here is on uh, the water tower in hers one of them is on the green building in dallas at thousand like a thousand feet or something like that and that thing's got a huge footprint so repeat a repeater station simultaneously transmit the signal of another amateur station on a different channel or channels so you talk in and it retransmits your your um, uh, message or your your voice on a different frequency uh, or the output of the frequency. So you talk into the input, and it retransmits at a much higher power on the high, on the uh, uh, on the output. So how it work? How how does it work? So in this uh, this first little article here, if you uh, uh, you transmit into the into the repeater. It just takes that input and then it retransmits it out. Um, that's uh, that's one way. And then when you let off the next person, your your radio will actually, if it's set up properly, when you push the PTT, your radio will shift up or it'll shift down depending on the uh, uh, which way it needs to shift in order to get into the repeater every band has its own um you know positive or negative offsets and uh information the center one right here this is an actual repeater setup there's a uh, uh repeater in there the white things and the, the the cans those are actual filters those filter out everything except what the repeater is transmitting uh, and trying to listen for it it's a way of preventing uh um it's a way of preventing interference um even from the repeater itself um then the third picture here this kind of gives you a, a a representation so in the green right there they can't the two radios can't reach each other they can, they're not able to that could be a a mountain or a building or a, just a distance of some sort so you talk in on uh, the input, and the sole purpose of a repeater is just to increase your range. That's that's what it does. That's its so why it exists is just to ex to uh, expand out the range of of an HT primarily. So that's uh, uh, th that's the basic concept of how a repeater works. If you're using a link repeater, you'll be keying up multiple repeaters. So not just the one that you're talking into. You may be keying up one that's 500 miles away and one that's right down the road as well as the one. So the link ones, you know, you may um, you may activate at the same time as, you know, when you're trying to get in, into uh, into the your primary one. All right. So looking at this. This is a uh, this is showing a a simplex in A, so transmitter A and receiver A. That's 
Transmitter uh, A is from station one, receiver A is from station two. They're able to um, talk to each other without issue. They're in the same, uh, they're going the same direction. You know, they're sitting pretty much clear, um, clear line of sight. Um, full duplex is another way that you can, you can um, talk to another vehicle without being in going through a repeater. It's more complex. You have to set up your radio to um, car A. You have to set up your transmitter and your receiver frequency. And then on, on B, you have to set up the the exact opposite. So you've got frequency A and B in car A. Well, and then in B, you've got B and A. And so that way, whenever one of them is transmitting, the the um the car that is needing to talk is shifting to the the listening frequency in the other car if that makes sense it's it's kind of like the you know kind of kind of like what's a good one? both directions at the same time the transmitter a to receiver a and transmitter b to tra- it's called full duplexing it's a uh very complex way to actually do communications from vehicle to vehicle i would recommend it but it is something that you you can and are allowed to do all right so how does how does this kind of work a repeater receives the transmit frequency from the amateur it goes through the duplexer duplexers are basically kind of like filters um a duplexer is a device that permits two signals to run through it at the same time you will often have two output two two freak two uh uh antenna connections on a on a repeater itself and one transmits and one's received but you have to have a duplexer in the middle there to keep the transmitter from just destroying the 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 receiver just because a receiver can't handle that kind of high power so the signal goes through the controller and offsets the incoming frequency to the transmitter output of the frequency which is the frequency <laughs> the amateur listened to in the first place. So it's the output frequency of the repeater. You always listen on the output uh, frequency of the repeater. You transmit in on the input frequency, which is different. Um, This kind of gives you a little bit of a, a representation of how, how that works. It even includes a phone line for, if you're going to do uh uh, patch uh, phone patch you don't see that a whole lot anymore but uh, it is still something that's that's out there all right auxiliary repeater or space stations can automatically retransmit the signals of other amateur stations uh, the difference between the repeaters transmit and receive frequencies is called the offset these are standard um standardized um, frequencies so on two meter it's your offset can be either positive or negative um, 600 kilohertz 0.6 megahertz on 440 it's 5 megahertz uh, positive or negative just depending on where in the band you are so it can be positive and negative but it's on two meters it's 600 kilohertz and then on on 440 it's five always um, if you're going to stay you know follow the band plan listening to the repeaters input is a common use of uh of the reverse split so if you have somebody who's having trouble getting into a repeater you can hit that reverse split button and it will actually flip your radio to where it's now listening on the input of the repeater and it will try to transmit on the output. Um, doesn't it, it completely? It, it's basically a way to listen to see if somebody is making it into the repeater, um, or if they're if they're just you know they've got a weak signal. As I said, the most common repeater frequency offset in the two meter band is plus or minus. Uh, depending on where you are in the pan, 600 kilohertz. And if you look at this uh, little chart right here, um, each each band has their own. So two meters, 600 kilohertz. UHF is five, 925 megahertz offset. 
10 meters is 100 and and so on and so on that that uh, repeaters are on the common repeater frequency offset for the 70 centimeter band or 440 meter is 440 band is 5 megahertz that is uh pretty standard across the across the uh the 440 band common problems that might cause you to not to be able to access a repeater whose repeater whose output you can hear uh can be any any number of things improper transceiver offset you could have an offset of the you know you're not transmitting into the repeater on the right frequency you're using the wrong ctcss cone tone what this is is um this is a system where or dcs code both ctcss or pl um as another name for it or dcs code those are either a tone or a code that's injected into your signal that the repeater is listening for before it will activate it's an interference method is basically what it does it's it's there for uh so you don't hear all of the the lightning strikes because you know the lightning put it's will put out a lot of interference and when if it doesn't have a ctss tone or dcs code it will hear that think somebody's transmitting and it will transmit just noise so it, a ctcss tone is not a privacy thing if you turn it on don't think that other people won't be able to hear you um, that's not what it is it is an interference um, prevention tool ctcss is the term used to describe a sub audible tone something you can't hear as the radio will put it in there after your your actual signals from your you know from the radio go to the transmitter and then the other the other radio will remove that subaudible tone so you won't hear it and even if you have a scanner the scanner will remove the subaudible tone it's something that you can't hear but it it just keeps uh keeps your station protected from interference your station's call sign followed by the word monitoring indicates that you are listening to a repeater um that is very common for uh, somebody to say monitoring rather than CQ, you know, K85HOI monitoring just means, hey, I'm here, I'm listening. If somebody wants to talk, I'm here. So that's another uh, another word that we will oftentimes say is monitoring. Your station's call sign followed by the word monitoring in case that you are listening to a repeater. I just said that. Um, the frequency coordinator recommends transmit and receive channels and other parameters parameters excuse me for auxiliary and repeater stations the frequency coordinator recommends transmit and receive channels and other parameters for auxiliary and repeater stations that doesn't seem like a full sentence um excuse me there uh frequency coordinators are selected by amateur operators in a local or regional area whose stations are eligible to be auxiliary or repeater stations. Um, so sending a, the call sign using CW or phone emission is the method of call sign identification required for a station transmitting phone signals. Um, Let me reread that. Sending the call sign using CW or phone emission is the method of call sign identification required for a station transmitting phone signals. Um, okay, so if you're using if you're using a repeater, you can use your your voice. If you are using uh, simplex, you you can use CW also. So we're going to uh, ask a little bit about the the amateur stations here or the uh, the uh, repeaters. So, what type of amateur station simultaneously retransmit the signal of another amateur station on a different channel or channels? Uh, beacon, an earth station, a repeater station, or a message forwarding station? It's going to be a repeater station. Retransmitting is what a repeater station does. What types of amateur stations can automatically retransmit the signal of other amateur stations? Um, auxiliary beacon or earth station, earth repeater or space, 
beacon repeater or space, or repeater, auxiliary, or space stations. What a mouthful. Um, it's going to be repeater, auxiliary, or space stations. So what is me? What is meant by repeater offset? It's the difference between a repeater's transmit and receive frequencies. The repeater has a time delay to prevent interference. The repeater station's identification is done on a separate frequency or the number of simultaneous transmit frequencies used by a repeater. The offset is the difference between the repeater's transmit and receive frequencies. Um, two meters is going to be 600 kilohertz. Uh, 440 or 70 centimeters, five, those are the really the big ones that uh, you may encounter more than other others. So how is a, UA, a, v, a VHF, UHF transceiver's reverse function used? This is the, the um, it's usually a button on there that you can, uh, oh, I'm actually reading the question. How is a VHF, UHF transceiver's reverse function used? to reduce power output, to increase power output, to listen on a repeater's input frequency, or to listen on a repeater's output frequency. A uh, proper answer on that one is going to be to listen on a repeater's input frequency. So your radio is normally going to be listening to the repeater's output frequency. And then you've got that one button on there um, that will allow you to reverse so you can listen to the input just for, um, you know, diagnosing issues or somebody's having issues trying to get in or not. So that's what the, uh, what that, that main fun function is for. What is the most common repeater frequency offset in the two meter band? Talked about that just a minute ago, plus or minus five megahertz plus or minus 600 kilohertz. Plus or minus 500 or plus or minus one megahertz. Two meter band, standard 600 kilohertz. Most of the uh, the the Japanese radios, and uh, if you don't know what that means, you as you're you're studying to find your first radio, you'll you'll discover that there are a lot of Japanese radios and there are a lot of Chinese radios. The Japanese radios will generally have this preset in the in the radio itself so you don't have to think about it a lot of the chinese radios you know they work fine they're they're good radios but you have to set the offset uh each time uh that you're gonna go from two meter to 440 um and then it, it will be in there properly if you program the radio itself um what is a common repeater frequency offset in the 70 centimeter band 5 megahertz, 600 kilohertz, 500 kilohertz, or 1 megahertz. 70 centimeters is going to be uh, 5 megahertz. That is standard. Uh, which of the following could be the reason you were unable to access a repeater whose output you can hear? All right, improper transceiver offset. You are using the wrong CTCSS code, or you're using the wrong DCS code, or all of these choices are correct. 99% of the time, all of it, it's going to be one of these issues. Um, so the actual answer is all of these choices, but these would be your where you'd want to start if you're not able to. Uh, if you are not able to access, if you're not able to actually transmit into the repeater and it respond to you. What is the term used to describe the use of subaudible tone transmitted with normal voice audio to open the squelch of a receiver? Carrier squelch, tone burst, DTMF, or CTCSS? CTCSS. So that's going to be your most common way. Uh, which of the following indicates that a station is listening on a repeater and looking for a contact? CQ, CQ, followed by the repeater's call sign, the station's call sign, followed by the word monitoring, uh, the repeater call sign, followed by your call sign, or QSY, followed by your call sign. It's just going to be station's call sign, Followed by the word monitoring. K5HOI monitoring. 
or you know any any whatever your call sign will be just you know just throw that out there somebody will usually come back to you if they're available just to just to talk and, and hopefully get to know you which of the following entities recommend transmit receive channels which of the following entities recommend transmit receive channels and other parameters for auxiliary and repeater stations frequency spectrum manager appointed by the fcc volunteer frequency coordinator recognized by local amateurs the FCC regional field office or the ITU. Going to be volunteer frequency coordinators. They are uh, they are local amateurs that are actually what they do is uh, they will you apply so you want to you want to put a repeater up and you need a frequency pair for your your repeater because these things are are coordinated. You will apply for a frequency or a repeater pair through the the re, uh, frequency coordinator. They'll look around and say, "Okay, these here's all these repeaters are on this frequency. If we give them this this pair, then he won't interfere. Here's your new pair." And so they are they are the middleman there that coordinate and help keep you from uh, having interference. Who selects a for a frequency coordinator? Uh, the FCC field office spectrum management and coordination policy, local chapter of the Office of National Council of Independent Frequency Coordinators, uh, amateur operators in a local or regional area whose stations are eligible to be auxiliary or repeater stations, or FCC regional field office. FCC doesn't want it to be in our business, um, and so the answer is going to be amateur Amateur operators in a local or regional area whose stations are eligible to be auxiliary or repeater stations. <clears throat> what method of call sign identification is required for a station transmitting phone signals? Uh, send the call sign followed by the indicator RPT. Send a call sign using the CW or phone emission. Send the call sign followed by the indicator R or send a call sign using the phone emission. This is the one that tripped me up based on the wording. So when you're using a, a station, you're talking to somebody um, through a repeater, you send the send your call sign using CW, whoop, let me try that again, using CW or phone. Um, either one is, is fine. It would be weird if you were having a phone conversation and you tapped out your call sign, that would be weird but it would be fine so uh generally just saying your call sign is uh is fine most repeaters will give their output or give their identification through cw because they have a complex controller okay um let's see here we are we are we're actually doing pretty good we've got uh not too much more uh, two more sections, and then we uh, we should be able to call it a night for tonight. Um, our next section is going to be emergencies. Uh, we do have quite a bit of emergency capability. Um, and those can range anything from storm spotters to for just providing emergency communications for, you know, uh, let's say a, a hurricane blows through. Um, one of them is called ARIES, Amateur Radio Emergency Service. This is a group of licensed amateurs who have voluntarily registered their qualifications and equipment for communications duty and public service. You own the machine, own the equipment, but there's some sort of failure, and you can fill, you know, you can you can become that cog that fail, and you can you can fit into the operation that um, by providing uh, your equipment and providing uh, communications. So that's emergency radio emergency service, ARIES. Amateur radio operators are well known for their voluntary assistance in emergencies from local problems like national disasters, 9-11, uh, hurricanes Katrina and Ida. Um, during hurricanes, we actually have dedicated hurricane nets where the, the frequency has been blocked off to uh, provide hurricane communications only um if i remember right uh i was told about i think it was one it was either katrina or ida whenever the uh puerto rico got hit 
amateur stations went down there and set up communications because the phone lines were down, the cell phones, the internet, everything, everything was down. Everything was devastated. And so they were able to provide communications and get messages out um, to those that needed to, you know, just to let family know or let emergency services know, you know, statuses or whatever like that. Those are services that are provided by amateur radio uh, emergency service or Aries. An acceptable accepted practice for emergency operator who has checked out into emergency traffic net is to remain on frequency without transmitting until asked to do so do so by net control station unless you're reporting emergency. Listen, just listen. That's that is going to be your the biggest thing that you can do. If you're called, you provide the information you need, but. You just you. The main thing is you want to listen and see what it is that they are in need of. Um, you don't want to get on there and just tie up a a repeater or a uh, say a hurricane net or something like that with just frivolous information that's not going to actually benefit. Um, there is never a situation when the FCC rules don't apply to the operation of an amateur station. The FCC rules always apply. They will always apply. There is a second uh, emergency communication system called RACES, Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Services. And I'll tell you what the difference of those is here in just a second. Uh, radio, the RACES is a, is a radio service using amateur frequencies for emergency management of civil defense communications. Okay. A radio service using amateur stations for emergency and management for civil defense and an emergency service using uh, amateur operators certified by a civil defense organization that's been enrolled in the organization. All of these are, are what RACES is. RACES is a, um, it is a radio service that provides communications abilities to a government entity. Uh, you cannot have a RACES program or RACES net without a sponsoring agency, a government agency. Um, one of the big the big ones that uh, I've heard about you know, for years and I participated in is Skywarn. Um, our downtown downtown Fort Worth, they have a uh, um, a Skywarn program that um, you have to actually do some FEMA courses and then you have to go to uh, the Fort Worth EOC and be trained on how to, how to provide the information. So it's, it's a specialized, you, I mean, you're certified and only people who are racy certified during a racy's net can operate. It's, this is different from Aries where Aries is anybody can provide their services Races is identified, trained, qualified, background tracked, usually, you know, specific people who are trained to provide what a government agency is is actually looking for. So Aries is anybody, Races is is only authorized people. Races is an FCC Part 97 amateur radio service for civil defense communications during national emergencies. Um, in an emergency, authorized hams participating in a Races organization may communicate from a police helicopter. Um, I have experienced in the past um, a local 911 station uh, had had problems. They, they had some sort of electrical issue. Uh, so the fire department activated races in the city to position people throughout the city to where if somebody had a problem, a person could go and talk to the races member. And then that races member could relay information to uh, fire department, police department, whomever. Uh, and amateur station control operators are permitted to operate outside the frequency privileges of their license class. Only, 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 if necessary, in situations involve immediate safety of human life or protection of property. Okay, this this causes a lot of controversy among among hams. Um, what this is talking about is 
if you're him, you're out somewhere and you have a radio on your your uh on your side and you go and there's a police car right there and something's going on and and I mean honestly the quickest way to get information would be to get on the police radio. Uh, but you have your radio right here, your your ham radio, where you could relay that. If you get on that police radio, you better have a very good excuse of why you're on that radio when there was a phone, let's just say a phone or a radio or, you know, any number of what any when there was something else that you could use to pass this information uh, if there's nothing else, if if your radio's dead, if if you know there's no phone service, and the police officers on the ground, you know, heard or something like that, then you can get on the radio to pass. Hey, uh, you know, here's what's going on. I'm a citizen. There's no other way for me to get a hold of you. I'm I'm relaying this information. That's that's what this is talking about. Um, it has to involve immediate safety of human life or protection of property before you go on and get on whatever radio. You still have to follow the rules uh, unless somebody is, you know, if somebody is going to be uh, in worse shape. Net con- NCS or net control station duties. So a net control uh, will call a net to order and direct communications with uh, checking in. So a, a, a net is basically a group of hams who all come to one one area. Let's just say um, uh, a weather net has come up. So you have a net control. You got he's he's the one directing or she is the one directing traffic. But you have let's say fifty hams out there in the field saying I see rotation or I uh, we have flooding or something like that or hey we're just doing check ins. Your net control station is the one who will call the net. They will direct the net. If you say, hey, I have traffic for somebody, can I relay that? The net control will either give you permission, tell you to wait, or uh, deny your request. So they are the like air traffic control in a way. Uh, formal message, messages exchanged by net stations is what's called traffic. The preamble in a formal traffic message contains information needed to uh, track the message. Um, I don't have one of those those cards with me, but there's there's a lot of information on a traffic message, like uh, where the message came from, where it's going to, how many how many uh, um, words are on it, and for checking things, um, and then it can be passed around across the country and be able to be reliably delivered at the end point, whether that's somebody trying to send me a message. So they send a traffic and, and, you know, it bounces between different message handlers. Ultimately somebody calls me with, you know, the traffic that's, that's how it's designed. So a characteristic of good emergency traffic handling is passing messages exactly as received. Uh, to ensure that voice message traffic containing proper names and unusual words are copied correctly by the receiving stations, such words and terms should be spelled out using phonetic, using the standard phonetic alphabet. Uh, to ensure that voice message traffic, you're going to use, it's basically on there, it's called a checksum, or the term check in reference to a formal traffic message, it will be a count. Um, there were 25 words in this uh, in this this mess in this message. That way, at the end point, they're looking at it. They're not going, man. I wonder what this says. Um, you know, each each point along the way, they can say, "Hey, I'm supposed to have 25 letters. Please repeat." Yeah, and so I can make sure I've got everything right. It's a way of uh, error checking. Um, So this is the emergency section here. Um, let's talk about areas. What is what is an amateur radio emergency service? A group of licensed amateurs who have volunteered voluntarily registered their qualifications and equipment for communications duty in the public service. It's a group of licensed amateurs who are members of the military and who voluntarily agreed to provide the message 
and handling, excuse me, handling services in case of an emergency. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, a training program that provides licensing courses to those interested in obtaining amateur license to use during emergencies or a training program that certifies amateur operators for membership in the races, uh, races, race, races, amateur civil emergency service. Ooh. Um, a is going to be the, the proper answer. On that. It's going to be a group of licensed amateurs. Basically you say, here I am. How may I help? Which of the following is standard practice when you participate in a net? When first responding to the net control station, transmit your call sign name and address in the FCC database. Um, maybe. Record the time of each of your transmissions. Uh, unless you're reporting emergency, transmit only when directly by net control or D, all of these choices are correct. Well, I apparently made it obvious that A is not it, but C is. Um, only transmit when needed. Don't need to get on there and, and, you know, make a show and, and things like that. Uh, when do FCC's not FCC rules not apply to the operating station of an amateur radio station when operating in races, when operating under special FEMA rules or Aries rules or FCC rules always apply. They always apply. What is the radios the radios emergency radio amateur civil emergency service? Um, a radio service using amateur frequencies for emergency management or civil defense. A radio service using amateur stations for emergency management for civil defense communications. Uh, an emergency service for using amateur operators certified by a civil defense organization as being enrolled in that organization, or D all the above. The answer is actually D, all of the above. It's all, all about civil defense service is, is what RACES is. What is RACES? Uh, it's an emergency organization combining amateur radio and citizens band operators and frequencies, an international radio experimentation society, a radio contest held in a short period, sometimes called a sprint, or an FCC Part 97 Amateur Radio Service for Civil Defense Communications during national emergencies. Um, that was going to be D. It is uh, it is found under Part 97. Part 97 um, is going to be our amateur radio's rule book. You'll find everything regarding amateur radio rules in Part FCC Part 97. Um, so you can look that up. It may not hurt to have just a copy of it, just just in case. But Part 97. Are amateur station control operators ever permitted to operate outside the frequency privileges of their license class? N no. Uh, yes, but only when part of a FEMA emergency plan, a RACES emergency plan, or yes, but only in situations involving the immediate safety of human life or protection of property. <clears throat> That one is going to be only during situations involving immediate safety of human life or property, protection of property, excuse me. All right, which of the following are typical duties of a net control station? Choose the regular net meeting time and frequency. Ensure that all stations checking into the net are properly licensed for operation on the net frequency. Call the net to order and direct communication between stations or all of the choices are correct. Answer is going to be C. They are the air traffic control of the airwaves while a net is going on. Uh, the regular net meeting time and frequency, that's usually coordinated by the manager. Um, the ensure the station is checking in are properly licensed. Maybe, but the proper answer is they will call and call to order and direct the communications between stations. What does the term traffic refer to in net operations? Uh, messages exchanged by net stations, the number of stations checking in and out of a net, uh, operation by mobile or portable stations, or requests to activate the net by a served agency. What does traffic mean? It's going to be messages exchanged by net station. Uh, and like I said, that's a, it's a formal, formal high page document. Um, 
you put specific information where it's going, who it came from, when it start, your checksum, um, you know, phone numbers, and, and then your your message, your message, depending on what it is. And it is a a limited message, as in like, I think you can put maybe maybe thirty words on it. It's it's intended to be brief. What information is contained in the preamble of a formal traffic message? Uh, email address of the originating station address of the intended recipient, the telephone number of the addressee or information needed to track the message. The information in the preamble is going to be the informa information needed to track the message because they are, if you put a message into the national traffic system, it's, it's going to get where it's going. And this is the preamble is how they track what it is that they're trying to do or trying to, trying to, to get to. Uh, which of the following is a characteristic of good traffic handling? Passing messages exactly as received, making decisions as to whether messages are worthy of relay or delivery, uh, ensuring that newsworthy messages are relayed to the news media, or D, all of the choices are correct. So at no time do you make the decision if something is newsworthy or a message is worthy. So you pass the message ex exactly as received to the next person and your responsibility for that message is done. Uh, what technique is used to ensure that voice containing that voice containing unusual words are received? Um, send words by voice and Morse code. Speak very loudly into the microphone. Spell the words using standard phonetic alphabet or D all of the all of the above. The way that you make sure that you your letters are are what they are is using the phonetic alphabet. That's a very common thing that's used in uh, in amateur radio. So learn to love it because you will. I hope. What is meant by check in a radiogram? Um, a, the number of words or word equivalents in the text portion of the message, the call sign of the originating station, a list of stations that have relayed a message, a box on the message form that indicates that a message was received and or delayed or relayed. Excuse me. A check is going to be like a checksum. It's, it's a way of guaranteeing that every bit of text is on that form like it's supposed to be. Um, if there's, if it says there's supposed to be 25 words on there or 13 words or 15 words, as you are taking the message and they read back your check is 15, you need to make sure you have 15 letters or 15 words in that message and that they make sense too. So, all right, weak signal propagation. We are getting close. I hope y'all are still with me. Um, this is kind of some of the fun stuff. So we're going to we're going to push through this. This last little section won't last but just a few more minutes. So hang with me. We're almost there. So weak signal propagation. What is it? Um basically the atmosphere refracts radio radio waves at slightly slightly permitting the radio horizon for the VHF and UHF signals to travel more distant than you, the visual horizon. So you're actually bouncing signals off of the uh, ionosphere. And what that does is that makes that makes your radio, the horizon for your radio further where they're, where, you know, your the horizon for your visual kind of stops right at that, you know, where the, where the earth is, you can't see over the, over the, the horizon there, but with a radio, if it bounces over, um, bounces off the ionosphere, it can actually go further, and that's that permits you to get very long contacts. Uh, there is a little effect of fog and rain on signals in the 10 meter and six meter bands. There's little effect of fog and rain on signals. Um, and that's yeah, that's that's pretty correct. Precipitation is weather is a weather condition that might decrease the range at microwave frequencies. So your microwave frequencies, your your you know 440 and higher may have trouble going distant ranges at uh 
uh, during rain and stuff like that because the, the rain will actually uh, cause it cause pro- problems with uh, the traveling frequency. <clears throat> So absorption is the effect of vegetation on UHF and microwave signals. The signal energy absorbed and turned into heat. Um, so simplex, this is one of the reasons simplex is, is sometimes difficult for long distance because uh, UHF signals are, are absorbed by everything, trees, buildings, uh, hills, Simplex UF, UHF signals are rarely heard beyond the radio horizon due to the UHF signals. Um, they're not propagated. If you if you get a signal in, in VHF and UHF, um, just because of the way that the ionosphere, ionosphere is, the signals are, are high enough to where they won't bounce back like HF. They will actually pass right on through and go off on, on into space. So you don't really get a lot of um a lot of uh, distance with VHF and UHF it's generally localized um a couple hundred miles maybe at the most so knife edge diffraction uh, effects knife edge diffraction effects might cause radio signals to be heard despite obstructions between uh transmitting and receiving stations um so if you look at this, it kind of where it goes up over up on over the uh over that mountain, that's kind of a rare thing. But if the conditions are just right, you might be able to get up over a mountain or up over a hill. Um sometimes. That's it's like I said, it's not something that you see very often, but it is something that, that happens. Uh, tropospheric ducting is responsible for over allowing over the horizon VHF and UHF communications to ranges of approximately 300 miles on a regular basis. This is kind of neat. I've seen this happen many, many, many times. Um, you get temperature inversion. You have cool air, warm air, and cool air, or the other way around. And what happens is a transmitter will transmit a signal. It will get either into the uh the the different layers and it will the signal will travel a long a really long way or it can get up into um the inversion that duct that's inversion and it'll bounce around and go for a really long distance um repeater here in in local repeater the uh there is another repeater down in south texas uh six or seven hundred miles away sometimes when it's cool and the the clouds are low and uh we have some some ducting we will hear an fm repeater from i think it's corpus christi texas coming up to uh to dfw that's six seven hundred miles that it's it's traveling in that that duct and so it's it's kind of rare but it's it happens um when it's cooler outside and and so it's it's a really neat thing to see happen so hopefully y'all uh will be able to see that happen but um it's basically caused by temperature inversions in the atmosphere um and that signal just gets up there and it, it just keeps bouncing around until it it can't go any further all right so a characteristic of vhf signals received by an auroral backscatter exhibits a rapid fluctuation of strength and often sound distorted so you you can bounce it's usually a six meter you might be able to get a two meter you can actually if you have a directional antenna you can you can aim that to an aurora and because an aurora is not a like a you know it's not stable it's shifting around you will hear a distorted receive like you'll receive a distorted message but you have bounced a signal off an aurora or um uh, meteor scatter is another one um six meters best for media scatter but as the a meteor comes in you know sometimes you'll see a, a green streak or a blue streak or something like that if you can 
time it to where you can you can actually bounce a signal off that. It's really pretty interesting what um, radio actually will do. All right, the ionosphere is a region of the atmosphere that can refract and bend HF and lower in VHF radio waves. Okay, so this is an example of the ionosphere. The one on the left, if you look at the one on the left, during the daytime, the ionosphere is broken up into many different layers. Um, the F, the uh, F1, F2, D, and E, I believe it is. When the sun goes down, and those are all at different levels, when the sun goes down, it actually collapses down into one high level F region. Um, and this is why at nighttime you will oftentimes get such distant contacts. It's because that F region is way up high and you can bounce a signal off of that and get to the other side of the earth easily. Uh, I've done it many, many times. Um, but during the daytime, it all breaks up, and as you can see, the D layer is just the D layer is not but 50, 50 kilometers um, off of the, and so that you're you're not going to get a very very large range. But once <clears throat> once that collapses down into just just one single F region, you can get a lot of good uh, what we call DX. So on HF, a technician class operator has phone privileges on the ten meter band only if uh any modern band plan will show you your permissions you can get on 10 meters uh you are power restricted uh as we said earlier uh the characteristic of hf communications compared with communications on vhf or higher frequency is long distance ionospheric propagation um that's more far more common on HF. HF is where you're going to get your long distance communications. You're not going to get really, you know, you might get six, six meters is called the matching band. You might get some good, uh, some good DX with, with six meters, but six meters is very, it, it comes and it goes and it comes and it goes. HF is where you can get more consistent long distance HF communications. If that's where you're going to go or where you want to go. Um, so single sideband phone may be used in at least some segment of all the bands above uh, 50 megahertz. And each band plan will tell you uh, specifically where you can use sideband. Sideband is um, it's a very stripped down modulation version. It doesn't have a carrier. Um, and so what happens is because it's such a, a simple Mo uh, simple mode it it has the ability to travel really far even on vhf like you can do two meters sideband and easily get a couple three four or five hundred miles that's that's not uncommon uh an amateur station transmitting communications for the purpose of observing propagation or related experimental activities is defined as a beacon in part 97 um anybody can set up a beacon um, I'm sure that there are steps to make it official if you plan it up full time. Um, but they, they, they reside on most of the HF bands and what they do is they just give you an idea of, um, propagation. So if you turn on the radio and you hear, like I'm here in Texas, if I hear something in Maine, I know that I can at least get to Maine because I'm hearing, or I'll be able to hear stations at least in Maine, maybe further, but you know, the beacon is in, in Maine and I can hear it. So uh, I should be able to hopefully get stations at least that far. Uh, from dawn to shortly after sunset during periods of high sun sunspot activities is generally the best time for long distance 10 meter band. Um, as that ionosphere is, is starting to collapse, uh, 10 meters will oftentimes really, really open up and you can get some good um, distance, some good DX 
out of that if you if if you are interested skip signals refracted from the ionosphere are elliptically polarized and can be received with either a vertically or horizontally polarized antenna Ooh, words um so as as you are sending sending a radio signal out you may have a horizontally par polarized antenna but that's okay because once it gets up there it's gonna kind of twist and shout a little bit and it you'll be able to receive with uh so, you know a, either a horizontally or polarized antenna just because of the nature of the rf so sporadic e skip is most commonly associated with strong over the horizon signals on the 10 6 and 2 meter bands from beyond the radio horizon um this is basically where um if you look in this this uh example here they're bouncing a signal they're sending a signal bouncing it off cloud it's bouncing off of the earth going back up to the clouds and to the receiver that will allow you to have pretty good um dx whenever it comes to uh making a a, a long distance contact uh the six and ten meter bands may provide long distance communications via the ionosphere's f region during the peak of the sun's sunspot cycle, we are in uh, actually in a cycle right now where there are becoming more sunspots. So when we have more sunspots, the atmosphere is more reactive; it's more active, and so you uh, you'll hear a lot of ham saying, "Oh, ten meters is hot tonight," um, and that's just because we're we're finally seeing more and more. Um, more and more sunspots, which cause the the ionosphere to react more and and um, open up. You know, the the band is open, is what you'll hear them saying. So, um, that is uh, something that you'll hear oftentimes with uh, with sunspots. Sorry, I meant to put the uh, the sun up there while I was talking about that. <clears throat> All right. Technician licensees are able are able to use 28.3 to 28.5 megahertz for phone operations. So you do have a little bit of 10 meter that you can uh, that you can you can activate. Um, but I think once once you you even try six meters and you then you try 10 meters, I think you'll get hooked and you'll want to get your, you know, upgrade to general. So you get more 10 meters because as I said, you upgrade, you get more privileges, not less. So the orientation of the electrical field is the property of a radio wave defining its polarization. I said that a minute ago, and that's basically how, how is it, how, how is it coming off of that antenna? Is it, is it, you know, upside down, or is it is it vertically polarized? Is it horizontally? Um, antennas generally will tell you what they how how they are polarized. Um, and let's just take um, um, if I, I don't know if you can see this, probably not. There's a I'm holding an antenna right here. It's it's um, about 15 inches tall. If I have an antenna like this. The the radio waves are gonna are going out like this. This is what's called a horizontal or it's horizontally polarized. If I turn it sideways, well now we're going vertically. So this is a vertically uh, polarized antenna. So it's depending on which way the radio waves are coming off of the antenna itself. So random combining of signals via different paths is likely to cause a regular fading. You'll hear fading in and out um, of signals received by the ionospheric reflection. Um, so you just, uh, there's a lot of trial and error whenever you're trying an antenna. If you have a, a large beam on top of a uh, an antenna, you know, you 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 will probably be fine. Hit you'll hit the ionosphere just you know strong. If you have a, ver, uh, a horizontal, you may have trouble getting distance because you're uh, you're you're not sending your signal up. You're sending a signal out. Okay, last little bit of uh, some questions here. 
So why is the radio horizon for VHF and UHF signals more distant than the visual horizon? Radio signals move somewhat faster than the speed of light. Radio waves are not blocked by dust particles. The atmosphere refracts radio waves slightly, and radio waves are blocked by dust particles. Answer is C. The atmosphere refracts radio waves, radio waves slightly. It's kind of like uh, when that when think of it when the the F layer contracts, it's almost like a mirror up there in the sky that your your signal just goes up and it bounces right back down. So what is the effect of fog and rain on signals in the 10 meter and six meter bands? Fog and rain and the six and 10 meter bands. Absorption, little effect, deflection, or range increase. So in 10 meter and six meters, you don't have a whole lot of effect. Uh, they're just high enough frequencies to where uh, you won't get a whole lot of a lot of issues with it. Um, so what weather condition might decrease the range at microwave frequencies? What weather condition might decrease range at microwave frequencies? High winds, barometric pressure, precipitation, or uh, colder temperatures. So higher frequencies have a, they're more susceptible to precipitation, uh, dust, uh, plants like trees, uh, buildings and so you have to determine your your use whatever it is that you're going to be doing based on what's around you uh, whether two meter 440 or even you know six meters or something like that so to, uh, just uh, consider what what it is that you're wanting to do and what's around you um, what is the effect of vegetation on UHF and microwave signals Knife edge diffraction, absorption, amplification, and polarization rotation. Vegetation on UHF and microwave signals is going to give absorption. So why are simplex UHF signals rarely heard beyond their horizon, radio horizon? Uh, they're, they're too weak to go very far. FCC regulations prohibit them from going more than 50 miles. UHF signals are usually not propagated by the ionosphere or UHF signals are absorbed by the ionospheric D region. And this is going to be UHF signals are not propagated by them. It goes right through them. Which of the following effects may allow radio signals to travel beyond obstructions between transmitting and receiving stations? Knife edge diffraction, Faraday rotation, quantum tunneling, Doppler shift. Those all sound really neat, but the answer is knife edge diffraction. <laughs> what type of propagation is responsible for allowing over-the-horizon VHF and UHF communications to ranges of approximately 300 miles on a regular basis? Trophospheric scatter, D-layer refraction, F2 re F2 layer refraction or Faraday rotation. Now we specifically talked about trophospheric scatter. All right, what causes trophospheric ducting? Discharges of lightning during electrical storms, sunspots or solar flares, updrafts from hurricanes and tornadoes, or temperature inversions uh, in the atmosphere. So trophospheric ducting is where a little duct of either cold or warm air is sandwiched in between cold or warm air, the opposite. Uh, and that will be temperature inversions in the atmosphere. <clears throat> what is a characteristic of VHF signals received via auroral reflection? Uh, they are often received from 10,000 or more miles away. They are distorted and signal strength varies considerably. They occur only during winter time hours, and they are generally strongest when your antenna is aimed west. They're going to be distorted, and they're going to sound funny. Uh, your signal strength may come and it may go. It just depends on on where in the uh, the aurora that uh, that you're actually bouncing your signal off of. What band is best suited for communicating via meteor scatter? That's going to be six meters. That's kind of that magic band. It does a little bit of everything. So six meters is going to be good for scatter. 
Which region of the atmosphere can refract or bend VHF or VHF radio waves? Stratosphere, troposphere, ionosphere, or magnetosphere? It's going to be ionosphere. That's going to be all of those different layers and, and during the day and then one, one solid layer at night. Um, on which... Uh, on which of the HF bands does a technician class operator have phone privileges? We talked about that briefly. Uh, it's going to be the 10 meter band, 28.3 to 28.5. So you get, get just a little bit of taste. And I assume they probably did that just to give you a little taste and get you, uh, get you hooked. Um, Cause once you're hooked, you, you know, you're going to, you just love it. It's fun. What is a characteristic of HF communication compared with communications on VHF and higher frequencies? Uh, HF antennas, antennas are generally smaller. HF accommodates wider bandwidth signals and long distance ionospheric propagation is far more common on HF or there is less atmospheric interference static on, on HF. So the characteristics is going to be Long distance ionospheric propagation is far more common on HF, for sure. Um, where there may where may uh, SSB single sideband phone be used in the amateur bands above 50 megahertz? Uh, only in subbands allocated to general class and higher licenses. Uh, only on repeaters and at least some segment of all of these bands, or on any band if the power is limited to 25 watts. It's going to be in at least some segment of all the bands. Every band plan that you will see, we will have some sort of little single side band SSB phone portion carved out there for you. Uh, let's see here. What is the FCC Part 97 def definition of beacon? Government transmitter uh, marking the amateur radio band edges. A bulletin sent by the FCC to announce a national emergency, a continuous transmission of weather information. Authorized in the amateur bands by the National Weather Service, an amateur radio, an amateur station transmitting communication for the purpose of observing propagation or related experimental activities. Well, as I told you previously, um, the government doesn't really want to have anything to do with us, so they they're not going to set up a any kind of beacons or a transmitter or weather service. So they, it is a amateur station transmitting for the purpose of observing propagation. Always. They're almost always out there. You can hear them just about any time. Uh, pretty, pretty neat uh, little thing. Uh, usually run by volunteers. Uh, what is generally the best time for long distance, 10 meter band propagation via the F region? Uh, from dawn shortly after sunset, from dawn to shortly after sunset during periods of high sun sunspot activity, shortly after sunset to dawn during periods of high sunspot activity, from dawn to shortly after the sunset during periods of low sunspot activity, or from shortly after sunset to dawn during periods of low sunspot activity. Word soup. But from dawn to shortly after sunset during periods of high spun sunspot activity. We are almost there, y'all. Hang with me. Which of the following results from the fact that signals propagated by the ionosphere are elliptically parallel, par, par, polarized? Excuse me. Uh, digital modes are unstable, either vertically or horizontally. Polarized antennas may be used for transmission or reception. FM voice is unusable. Both transmitting and receiving antennas must be the same polarization. Answer is going to be either a vertical or horizontally polarized antenna may be used for transmission or reception. Which of the following? Uh, which of the following types of propagation is most commonly associated with occasional strong signals on 610 to 2 meters uh, bands from beyond the radio horizon? Beyond the radio horizon, uh, backscatter, sporadic E, D region absorption, or gray line propagation. So that one is going to be sporadic E. Going to come from uh, beyond the radio horizon, sporadic E. 
Which of the following bands may provide long distance communications via the ionosphere's region, F region, during the peak, during the peak of the sunspot sunspot cycle? Uh, six and ten meters, twenty three centimeters, seventy centimeters, and one point two five meters, or all the choices are correct. Long distance communications via the Iron F region during the peak of sunspot will be six and ten meters, and you can get some amazing DX out of ten meters uh, during that time. All right, which of the following? Um, Frequency ranges are available for phone operation by technician licenses. So we're going to go with 28.3 megahertz to 28.5 megahertz. It's going to be C. Okay, what pro what property of a radio wave defines its polarization? The orientation of the electric field orientation of the magnetic field, the ratio of the energy in the magnetic field to the energy in the electric field, or the ratio of the velocity to the wavelength. That is going to be the orientation of the electric field is going to give you your polarization. All right. What is likely to cause, what is a likely cause of irregular fading of signals Propagated by the ionosphere. Frequency shift due to Faraday rotation and interference from thunderstorms, intermodulation distortion, or random combining of signals arriving via different paths. Our final question of the night. And the answer is random combining of signals arriving via different paths. And with that, that is the last bit I have for you tonight. That is a lot of information that we covered. Um, I would recommend that uh, maybe now you start taking practice tests. That would, uh, uh, we're, we're about a third of the way through. So if you do practice tests, you should roughly get about a, about a third of the questions um get your pens ready the one i recommend um oh i cannot remember what it was a oh, it used man. to be aa9pw yes yes yeah. somebody told uh, me the other day that website wasn't around anymore i'm going to pull it up right now but uh you can get practice tests on qrz or eham.net as well so um but start taking them it's not not too soon like I said, you should get about uh, probably a third of them, maybe more, if you've yeah. read through the material and yeah. um, well, it came up. and yeah. you know if you've got a, a pretty good understanding of it. So mm -hmm. um, for sure. So tomorrow when we come back, I uh, maybe we'll see some stories. Hey, I was you know I got halfway there, and you know, if you <laughs> yeah. if you got that, you're doing pretty good, but. Right. Oh, I tell you what, those those uh those words started kind of running together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. It was a long session, man. We were playing on three hours and we went four, so that's, yeah. that's okay. That's all right. Yeah, I think this is the longest one. I have to look and see. It was two hundred and fifty slides. I don't think the next ones are even close. Okay. okay. So, that's but good time. Enjoyed it still. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, we'll get through it. All right. So I just linked uh, aa9pw.com, which is up. I just pulled it up, so it's good. You can also go to qrz.com or eham.net and take practice tests there. They're free. You take as many as you want to um, and, and go from there. So tomorrow we will be, we will be back here at 6 p.m. Texas time, which is 2300 UTC for those of you in other time zones. Um, and we'll go for about three hours probably again, maybe a little bit closer to three hours this time. So come spend your Friday night with us, and uh, we hope um, – we hope you guys uh, got a lot out of this, and uh, the, the 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 live chat will be replayable, but you won't be able to comment in it after the live stream ends. So put your uh, put any questions you have in the regular comment section of the YouTube video, and uh, we will we will get those as we can. So seventy three all. Thanks again, Chris. Great session, and uh, we'll reconvene tomorrow. See you guys. <laughs>